Hello and welcome back to the podcast that must not be named. I am Luke. I am Melissa. And we are here joined with our Quidditch correspondent, sports extraordinaire, Abby. Welcome back. Hello, hello, hello. Man, you get to be on with us for a full episode. Yeah. So With everybody. Yeah, yeah. And so we are continuing our special book series in between books four and five of the Harry Potter series. We had the Quidditch Through the Ages book come out along with Fantastic Beasts that we talked about, what, two weeks ago? And this was originally came out in 2001. I didn't do my homework on this. Sorry. Uh, and I know we I questioned this last time that we were there as well. And uh, but yeah, so 2001, these two books came out and this is by Kenilworthy Wisp. And it w- originally came out for comic relief. Uh, all proceeds, all profits went to that charitable case uh, and. Now it's actually split between Lumos and Comic Relief as well. Um, so really, really great cause. Get out there and buy a copy of both of these books. I'm really excited to talk about this one as well. Uh, I just remember these books being such a departure from everything we had in the Harry Potter series at the time and a lot of great just magical history and things like that. So to get us started, this book was published by Wiz Hard Books. And we are greeted on the very front cover with a property of Hogwarts School Library stamp. So it's essentially the checkout list of students that have borrowed the book. Apparently they haven't had this copy that I've got, and I think Melissa's is probably the exact same, uh, for more than a year <laughs> since uh, we, we got... Mine looks different. Does yours look different? What does yours look oh, like? Just the cover. I don't know if... Mine's a hardback. Okay. This is the newer version. I yeah, believe. Yours is the one that came out in 2017. Yeah, I think yours is the same one Lorelai has. I have, I have like the Hogwarts library. Yes. Yeah. Set. Okay. So, All right. yep, that has, that's this one right here. And that matches the audiobook exactly. It, if okay. you listen to it side by side, it's going to be what they read for the audiobook. There are some very minor changes from what the original 2001 printing had. Um, they don't really alter much other than there's just some been some updates and they slightly worded things differently. Um, and there's Melissa has even a different copy Ooh, of cool. it there as well. Which which one is that? I haven't I don't recognize that it, one. Um, it comes from my daughter's bookshelf. OK, um, so check out your local daughter's bookshelf to see if they have that one available. This, this edition was printed in July of 2016. OK, which um it looks like it's the same. It, the page, they're like the chapters are broken up a little better by individual page holders okay. of, sn- of snitches. So it's not quite so condensed. It's a little bit longer, but mostly because of um, the way it's printed. It's the same text, I believe. Gotcha. So my edition, this edition, first printing March 2017. Mm-hmm. So the Hogwarts Library version that you have there, Abby, yes. it has all three books, The Fantastic Beasts, Quidditch Through the Ages, and Tales of Bela Bard, which we can't True. get to until basically after book seven. Right. Um, so spoiler, spoiler, because uh, we try to be spoiler free. So the the real difference on why that group came out when it did was because it matched up with the first fantastic beasts movie. So there were some updates that fantastic beast textbook got to match the things that were going to be in the first fantastic beasts movie. I see. So it got an update there and a refresher and they put all three out with some other minor tweaks, uh, at least to Quidditch of the ages. I haven't read through tales of the bard in that edition personally yet. Uh, to do a side by side, if there's any changes there, I would be surprised if there's much. But so that's why that group of books came out when it did, and why there are some slight updates because it's also what 16 years after the first publishing. So there was right. just more information that she wanted to, she being J.K., wanted to work into these uh, supplementary texts, I guess. So on the very f- inside cover of of the original paperback version which is the main one that we're going to be talking about again this one has even slight or the hard cover it should be exactly the same i believe um the o- the only real differences on this are more slight wording but there is the property of hogwarts 
school library, and I'll just read a couple of the names of note that have checked this book out. There's Oliver Wood, there's Marcus Flint, Cedric Diggory, Angelina Johnson, looks like there's Ernie McMillan, Terry Boot, uh, Fawcett, uh, Warrington, Not, Katie Bell, yep. Um, Yours are different. Millicent Bolstrode, and then Fred Weasley, Hermione Granger, and H. Potter. So, at the very bottom of this uh, property of Hogwarts School Library stamp, there is a warning. If you tear, if you rip, tear, shred, bend, fold, deface, disfigure, smear, smudge, throw, drop, or in any other manage, damage, mistreat, or show lack of respect towards this book, the consequences will be as awful as it is within my power to make them. Irma Pence. Hogwarts librarian. So that's that's great. It. That's that's I wonderful. <laughs> so Abby, yours does not have that? I don't see on mine that Oliver Wood had ever checked it out. I have Ron Weasley, and then obviously somebody else's handwriting writes behind his name stinks. Oh yeah. And then Neville Longbottom S. Bones is great. <laughs> H. Granger, Padma Patil, E. McMillan, M. Bolstrode, Mil- Millicent. Yeah, it just says M. H. Granger and D. Malfoy. Huh? Yeah, but that is that's quite a bit. And there's also a tic tac toe. There's a tic tac toe, and there's a little heart. A little heart with an arrow through it at the top. Hm. And I mean, the coolest librarian for the win with the same warning. I do like. Maybe they had to get multiple copies because by the time yours was published, or my mine was published, that had been you know not returned to the library. Now well, the question. Go popular, ahead, Melissa. Copy, popular copies of books, libraries have multiple copies right. of popular books. One would assume it's just a different copy of the same that, book. That's what I would think. Too. Now, I'm going to say that's somewhat true. It's hard to say because Hermione Granger checked both of these editions out on March 2nd. <laughs> Maybe she was looking for, for like... She was cross referencing. I have March... 14th for her and oh and again on the second second of may yes yeah oh of may May. okay i read that wrong okay so yeah they are different then so she's checked it out three times total twice in the newer version and only once okay i feel better about that anyway (laughs) her mind anything to do yeah she had to revisit because you know the boys were all talking about it and she felt left out um we know she knows her stuff so yeah so that's our special note from Madam Pence. Really, really funny. And there's also a special foreword written by Albus Dumbledore, which goes into detail about... And this this was another thing that had been slightly changed a little bit, um, which we'll talk about in a little while. But um, it talks about, hey, don't mistreat this. It just echoes the same things that Madam Pence's warning was, was stating. Uh, it also kind of prefaces what comic relief was at the time and the updated one talks about comic relief and lumos so that's a slight change um we also work into the idea that Abel's domador goes through i'll say an extensive description of how this is a purely fictional uh sport and to take none of this uh, seriously, and please don't try to play at home. But may I also take this opportunity to wish Puddlemere United the best of luck next season. <laughs> I love that. I will say about this whole book, the foreword the, about the author, everything is written in such a way that a sports commentator or a sports fan, like a dedicated sports fan, you cannot but help yourself put those things in. Oh, and I'm talking about hockey and blah, blah, blah. Oh, are you going to see the Blues game later on today? Like, you can't help but say those things. Your, your oh, biases base- show a bit. Yeah, like, I'm a baseball fan, and this is really great. Man, that we're, it was really unfortunate the Cardinals ended this way this season. Even though it has nothing to do with what you're talking about, <laughs> you cannot help but throw those in there. Just like the, oh, and just like the dissatisfaction of all those cub fans out there or the which chudley cannons melissa pointed yes exactly right I'm you sorry can't. i don't understand why that's different it's <laughs> not it's just perfectly written as a sports person you're by like you can't help it it just happens sorry folks or if you if you do try to help it you usually overdo it and alienate the place that you came from I'm not going to point oh, anyone out Joe but that Buck. happens but oh that happens. i'm sorry sorry, Joe, sorry. that was not pointing things up I was, I was gonna leave it very vague but oh no i knew i was gonna i was 
two seconds behind Abby. It <laughs> was right. So another thing okay. that I I noticed in the the original printing, I don't think it occurs in the newer one. I'm going to cross reference very very quickly. Um, we have a specific galleon to dollar equivalency, which we have Ooh. never gotten before. I have not heard anything about that. So okay. I think that has yeah. to be right. So it's, it's not, it wasn't in the audiobook. I didn't think, but it specifically says widespread amusement is converted into large quantities of money over $250 million since they started in 1985. So this is talking about comic relief UK, uh, which is equivalent to over 174 million pounds or 34 million galleons. So 250 million dollars equals 34 million galleons. That's essentially 735 7.35 dollars per galleon. And uh I just thought that was very interesting because it's always vague. It's left not stated and it's you know when you don't have any relative scale you think, "Oh, well, one of the few price points we've ever gotten, especially at the point where we're at in the book series, is Harry's wand was seven galleons. And it's like, is that a lot of money? Is that not a lot of money? But then he wins a thousand galleons for winning the Triwizard Cup. Like it just did he get a special deal on his on his wand to make it seemingly that cheap compared to other things that he's bought? Um, so I don't know. I, I just thought that was very interesting that it's almost like an offhand notice here that and I'm sure, you know, inflation times change too. So it's, I'm sure it's not accurate now, but at and least currency rates. Right. Function. Yeah, absolutely. So it, I'm sure it's not valid at this point, but have cash on hand when you travel because your debit card will be charged something different than you thought. Yeah. It's word from the wise. Absolutely. Not so wise. Word so, from somebody who's been to Japan for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was very, very interesting. Uh, um, let's have, you guys talked about it all, what Lumos or Comic Relief is or does, or shall we check mark that for Let's another day? Let's do that. Give me one give me one second because I realized I, I kind of split between our actual introduction and before our part one. So let me finish the actual okay. introduction and then we'll actually talk about part one. I apologize. Um so this book itself is sixty one pages long. So it's a really quick read. I mean it's even quicker than Fantastic Beasts, I think. Uh, is very, very quick. Um, and in my mega excitement for it to come out, the illustrated edition is slated to come out October 2020. So it would be the final of the Hogwarts library books to be turned into the illustrated edition, which I'm very excited about. I think there's a lot of opportunities for that to be very well done, and I'm excited for that. So... Let's get into part one, where we've already talked about the library checkout card. Uh, we're going to cover the praise for Critics Through the Ages, the about the author, the contents in the forward. And again, the original printing has some of these things in the front of the book and some of them in the back of the book. But we're going to lump like all of this extraneous information that's not the true part of the book into one section here. So, Abby, you may be flipping to the very back of the book to reference a certain section. So... Abby, tell us a little bit more about what Comic Relief UK is and what Lumos is. And feel free to use uh, Dumbledore's descriptions of them. So what I just learned from um, their uh, website, it says, you know, you raise they raise and donate amazing amounts of money to the Red Nose Day, which I did not know they were a part of, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. And um, Sport Relief to help people living incredibly tough lives. Um, it kind of goes into a little more depth than maybe what we want to hear, but they don't just give out lump sums. It's over a period of time that they give out money. Um, they've raised nearly 20 million for, we've raised, I guess, us listeners, readers, consumers for comic relief, a magical amount of money. Um, I'm trying to read through this real quick because I just went to the back. Real sorry. We are particular. This is what they write. We are particularly, particularly, why can't I say that word? That's okay. Interested in helping those children who start their lives in the most difficult circumstances where there is conflict, violence, neglect, or abuse. So obviously, comic relief, you're not helping out a, a bozo there, mm -hmm. as Glenn would say. <laughs> These bozos. And uh, it, it basically, the way... Dumbledore puts in his forward, he, he says, um, Comic Relief UK uses laughter to fight poverty, injustice, and disaster. And I think it's a really powerful thing, right? Mm -hmm. And they support, I don't know a, a ton about the specific things that they do. If they put on other 
charity events with comedians and things like that as well. But I check them out, learn more about them, follow them on Twitter and Instagram. I'm sure that that they're available and would love to have you reach out to them. So uh, the Lumos portion of this, Abby, would you like to give a description of that as well? Yeah. So the Lumos charity, um, they say there are more than 8 million children living in orphanages worldwide, even though 80% of them are not orphans. So Lumos um, helps the institutionalize because their parents are poor and cannot adequately, adequately provide for them. I mean, if that's not more Harry Potter than... Mm-hmm. anything that's mm-hmm. insane eight million children living as orphans so that's pretty amazing that that reminds me very much of when melissa and i first started this podcasting company right and we we started talking about harry potter and you, you started talking about him growing up as an orphan and how maybe it doesn't seem to really affect him like it seems like it should and then we started our theoretical second series, which is still in the works. I'll just say that. But it's another story about a group of orphans. And we were like, why are we only picking books about orphans? Like, it just, it was just odd that the two that we had chosen at the time, it was a very common theme and it's treated very differently in, in both books. And, uh, but I think it's because it's such a prevalent and truly prescient thing in society that gets overlooked. And, so I think Lumos is doing wonderful, shedding light on on that issue, and that there are better ways of handling what's going on there. Appropriately named. Yeah, absolutely. Melissa, any thoughts on the the charities? I don't. I think it's worthy causes, and I like that we can track that the money is going to the things they say they're going to. So I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, the transparency is certainly nice. Mm-hmm. Round of applause! Yay! <laughs> rounding that out. Yeah. All right. Can I jump to something here that is the opposite of serious? Yes. But it might be like my favorite part of the book. If not like the most favorite part of the book, definitely one of the big highlights. Yeah. That would be the praise for Quidditch through the ages. And I'm literally going to read the whole thing. Good. Kenilworthy Wisp's painstaking research has uncovered a veritable treasure trove of hitherto unknown facts about the sport of warlocks. A fascinating read. Bethilda Bagshot, author, A History of Magic. First of all, I love that Bethilda Bagshot took the time to read another history book. She's a historian. She's a, an appreciator, right? And she I, is what I would say, like, the end-all, be-all historian. That's of what I, I mean, this is the stamp you want. Yep. If you're going to write a history book, she had better read it and better say, yeah, it's decent. Yeah, that's a stamp of approval right there. Yep. Here we go. Wisp has produced a thoroughly enjoyable book. Quidditch fans are sure to find it both instructive and entertaining. Editor, Witch Broomstick. Another pretty good uh, show of support, right? I, uh, that's a good marketing ploy, right? You, the auditor of the Broomstick magazine, mm-hmm. get, promote the book a little bit. Sounds good. Okay, here we go. The definitive work on the origins and history of Quidditch. Highly recommended. Brutus Scrimgeour, author, The Beater's Bible. That is an excellent like marketing, right? That That's who you want talking about your book. Mm-hmm. We spend a lot of time talking about how do we market our shows, this, this is what you want. You want the people who do the thing to tell other people, this is what you need. <laughs> Here we go. Mr. Whip Wisp shows a lot of promise. If he keeps up the good work, he may well find himself sharing a photo shoot with me one of these days. Gilderoy Lockhart, author, Magical Me. Amongst many other pivotal works, you know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so well, much- we do wish to be as a six. As successful as Gilderoy. Maybe not in, um, you know, our personal values, but in our money raising. There are certain celebrities. I would rather not have them give our show a uh, a vote of confidence. I would, uh, let's just not be affiliated. We're good. (laughs) Thanks, though. Yeah, you could. Thanks for the thoughts. (laughs) All right. Next praise. Bet you anything it'll be a a bestseller. Go on. I bet you. Ludovic Bagman. England and Wimbor Wasps Theater. <laughs> Another oh, great one. Oh, I'm so glad we're doing this after reading book four. Right. <laughs> Does he have his uh, wand to his throat? Does he <laughs> it loud and proud? That's what I want to know. Go on. I bet you. That's pretty good. How desperate is he? Really? I'll bet you anything. You want to bet? <laughs> Come, on. Come on. I really need it. Right. All right. And the last praise, which, in my opinion, is the highest praise one can receive. Here we go. I've read worse. Rita Skeeter, Daily Prophet. Pretty good. Enough said. 
Well, I have. <laughs> I like it. I, this was such a good way to bring in other personalities in a in a very realistic way. Mm-hmm. I thought that was brilliant of JK. So good job bringing in some past characters. Absolutely. And and definitely ones that make sense, right? These, these are people that would be talking about it. They would have a reason, either self-indulgent reasons or just, yeah, no, this is this is good stuff. Or they're, they're like a good sell for the book or they work in publishing or, you know, like Rita Skeeter, she works for a newspaper. So it makes sense that they would have like, you know, like a buy this book column. You know what I mean? The New York Times bestseller list, like the Daily Profit recommendation. Mm-hmm. I've read worse. Okay, great. <laughs> so I'm going to quickly read the about the author because very much like the Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them written by Newt's Commander, you can tell that JK has a fully formed thought of one, who this author is that's writing this book for us. And that voice carries through and how things are described through the oh. text, like staying in that character. Clearly she writes for many characters. So that's in her skill set, and she does a very good job at that. But I think that holds true. And knowing a little bit about who this author is, I think colors the way you read a couple of the uh, the items that we get to later on. About the author, Kenilworthy Wisp is a renowned Quidditch expert, and he says, fanatic. He is the author of many Quidditch-related works, including The Wonders of Wigtown Wanderers, He Flew Like a Madman, a biography of Dangerous Di Llewellyn, and Beating the Bludgers, a study of defensive str- strategies in Quidditch. Kenilworthy Wisp d- divides his time between his home in Nottinghamshire, or Nottinghamshire, I'm sure is the correct correct way of saying that, I apologize, and wherever Wigtown Wanderers are playing this week. His hobbies include backgammon, vegetarian cookery, and collecting vintage broomsticks. So, seems like a true expert in the field, great person to be writing this book for us. I particularly like the book titles. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I can't decide if I, I think my favorite of those is He Flew Like a Madman. Yeah, the biography of Di Llewellyn, Dangerous Di Llewellyn. Yeah. That's the one I would want to read. Yeah, that's a good one. All right, any any final thoughts on part one here? Okay. And that's obviously a, a contents, which we'll be going through in depth here. So we'll just tackle them as we go. Part two of our little episode here is includes chapter one, the evolution of flying br- of the flying broomstick. Chapter two, ancient broom games. Chapter three, the game from Queerditch Marsh. So, Abby, I'm going to kick it off with you. What are your first thoughts here? So I just want to mm, Luke, I have a very similar thought. to Go your, for it. No, go okay. for it. So while reading this, I was wondering, um, they talk about anim- magi, animagi. Yeah. Animagi, yeah. And they say, if you have a bat, then you get a bat brain. Do you take on the, that was like what stuck out to the most of this whole part to me. Like, wait, hold on. Are we learning things about this? Because we have seen Sirius in book three. He still seemed to have his mind about him, not necessarily a dog's mind. Um, So what, what do you take on when you transform into your animal counterpart? Yeah, that, no. But what really got me—that was the point. Yeah, you you hit exactly the same thought that I had. Which, if you think also back to very early chapter one of book one, where we have McGonagall sitting on the wall all day as a cat, right? And even book four, because we're finished with it at this point, right? And we know what Rita is, right? Then how is she reporting on this with a beetle brain? Like, yeah, I'm confused. I think there are legitimate questions here on the technology or the technical aspects of that. Melissa, what are your thoughts? I think that you're combining two sentences that are meant to be two separate thoughts. Okay. Here's Please explain. That the first sentence of the paragraph says, no spell yet devised enables wizards to fly unaided in human form. Fourth grade writing states that is your main topic sentence. Therefore, every sentence in the rest of this paragraph is a different detail that supports the main idea. The first detail is those few animagi who transform into winged creatures may enjoy flight, but they are a rarity. End of complete thought. Sure. A second separate thought is the next sentence. The witch or wizard who finds him or herself transfigured into a bat may take to air, but having a bat's brain, they are sure to forget where they want to go the moment. Difference between animagi and And transfigured into. So you guys, you guys are saying that, oh, they're transfiguring into a bat as an animagi. And I think it's if they become an animagi that flies, they are a rarity. Different 
happening is if you are transfigured by someone else because you've found yourself transfigured, aka Draco Malfoy, the the fabulous bouncing ferret, mm-hmm. right? Your its brain. I think that's. I think that's fair. I think that this is where my lifelong struggle with I miss that day in fourth grade has really come into play. Because I think you're probably right. No, and uh, right along with that is the audiobook. It it goes pretty quick through that portion Mm -hmm. where it almost leads into those thoughts being combined. And so without a, a strict delineation between those ideas and... Like, what are the definitions of how you use the word transfigure and how does that apply to animagism? But we don't, like, there's just open questions. The only reason I think it's separate is because the next sentence then talks about levitation is commonplace, but our ancestors were not content with hovering five feet from the ground. Mm-hmm. Here they wanted more. They wanted to fly like birds. So that kind of all goes together. But in my head, this was like, there were three distinct separate yeah. things. Those I didn't that hit that main idea of, we don't have a spell that can make you fly. I didn't listen to it on the audiobook. I read this. Mm-hmm. However, then I listened to it on the audiobook and I got the same thing that I had previously thought. Mm-hmm. But as this, you've told me here, like that makes complete more sense there are three separate ideas where there's probably commas all abound that I ignored. And um, I, I feel much better about this. Okay. And here's the thing. I bet that was the author's intent, but just because it wasn't like her intention was this, but there maybe wasn't enough distinction to make that happen. Right. In the page, like she saw it. And so it was obvious to her, but maybe yep. it's, it's obvious to the reader who isn't inside her brain. Yeah, no, I think that's completely, completely reasonable. And I'd like to point out that it's been a really long time since I've I've done writing because I'm not a very good writing teacher, but I can do this. (laughs) Melissa for the win. One point to Ravenclaw. Wild. (laughs) Let's be honest, no crowd has ever cheered for me. I'm a nerd, not a sporter. And I'm not a sporter. I, I, That's why she's not a sporter, because she calls us sporters. You sporters. Oh, this is my contribution to the Quidditch book. <laughs> Perfect. All right, Abby. What else? What else stood out to you in uh, in this uh, section? So we're going here. through chapter one, two, and three. Um, my other there is a museum of Quidditch in London, which I love because as a sports fan, you know there is the baseball hall of fame. Then there's your team's hall of fame. Sorry, I probably will be talking about baseball a lot as we go through here or the things that I know respectively. Sure. That's yeah. my bias. But like I have my our team's hall of fame it's super cool i just love that there's those little tiny um blips of truth like from what we would call the real world albus 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 has told us you know obviously this is fiction obviously this is not real however there's something pulled from our real lives i love that they have a museum in london and um my last real thought about this um nope there's two the broom was chosen because it's so incon- inconspicuous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, why wouldn't you choose a practical thing? If you're going to hide something, hide it in plain sight. Not weird that you have it. And um, the second annual broom race through a dragon uh, reserve. That sounds dangerous. <laughs> yes. Before thought- we, yeah, before we move on to chapter two, Melissa, did you have a thought on the discreet nature of brooms? I just like the fact that no one would be any wiser that it was something more than just a broom. Like, it's so boring. Everybody has a broom. Everybody has a broom. Well, sometimes you don't have enough broom. Sometimes you need a vacuum. But still, everybody has a broom. And why wouldn't you have a broom? (laughs) I really did just watch Hocus Pocus and Mary. You know, the the dark-haired lady in there. She rides a vacuum. Yeah, that was always the funniest. Yeah, that's the best. But it is still a mode of floor cleaning. So it, right, rules mm-hmm. apply. Everybody has a vacuum now. Um, it, it's like that. It's like you wouldn't just randomly have a backpack harness with wings. Right. Or a, a chair with like a, a with wings built into it, like, a, like a, a flying throne or something, right? Like that would be pretty conspicuous. I think flying carpets fit under the same sort of general rule. Mm-hmm around for centuries and centuries of course you have a carpet yeah not a big deal so i I just like that idea of it being discreet because of muggle wariness of witches throughout history Mm -hmm. absolutely so yeah abby let's move into chapter two at the ancient broom games uh you're talking about your annual broom race 
So I believe I have this pulled up here. And the annual broom race was, I'm going to totally butcher these names. So just deal with it. I'm going to try. Oh, my God. Arjeplog. Are, are you plog? Sure. And Copperberg. Yeah. Copperberg. Or, yeah. They're both in Sweden. That's, it's not out of a country. But if you wanted to drive it today, it would take 11 hours and three minutes. There you go. <laughs> that, I, I did your, uh, I Googled it. <laughs> so, and I wondered if those were real places because I am not uh, an educated American. I'm sorry. Europe. You're not. You're not too familiar with the small towns of Sweden. I mean, come no, on. I'm really not. I'm not at all. <laughs> I apologize, but I, I mean do. that's a pretty far distance. Yeah, I really like that. The uh, it's an international event now, right? And the uh, <laughs> the the fans start in Koperberg, and then they all apparate to Arjeplog to congratulate the survivors. Is the what it survivors. says. Survivors, <laughs> not the pictures. <laughs> Just yeah. celebrate the survivors. I, I feel like it's this like, is a marathon. Listen, I was going to say it's like an Iron Man, but oh. with like a Hunger Games twist. Yes. Oh yeah, no. This is this is great. Like this, this would be. A, I'm glad that this was the first one in there because uh-huh. this is interesting. Like that's that's a great oh, one. We had an Iron Man this weekend, and it totally disrupted like all life here <laughs> where I live. Like it disrupted <laughs> everything. Not to me because I just stayed home, but. <laughs> like the news was like then the iron man and then they're gonna be out there at five and then this road's gonna be closed so i cannot imagine what like this race would do except that it's on brooms and they just apparate so it's probably well, imagine, like, like, is much better than well, your muggle personification you know, like, the international statute of secrecy like all of the things they have to put in place right well, that's almost like the big convenience of flying through a dragon reservation. That should that's likely a fairly well protected area, at least for that yeah. portion of the race. Like you're and flying through a very distinct protected magically area as it is. There is a dragon reservation. Mind oh, blown. Yeah. Right. That's cool. Like where's yeah. Bill Weasley when we need him? Yeah. No, you need to you need to revisit your Fantastic Beasts uh oh, textbook yeah. too. Okay. It's it's quite good. I as well. do thoroughly love Quidditch, but I can't lie. I'm not an astute Hermione. Uh, this book is the only one of these that I have read. So maybe I'll do that. I apologize. It's good. It's 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 an enjoyable read. And also check out our episode from two weeks ago if you missed it. Apparently she did. <laughs> the The final thought I have on the, uh, the annual Swedish race is that the trophy is a Swedish short, short snout. It's shaped like the, one of the dragons that they essentially fight, fly through the reservation of. So that's that's nice. I like that. Um, we've got a couple other games here as well. Some pretty I interesting did. ones. And I, I wanted so desperately to pick a favorite. And like every single, well, there's three that really stand out. It's like, I like that one. No, I yep. like that one. No, I like that one. There's <laughs> that are good. But the first one is Stitch Stock. Yep. The one mm-hmm. where like the, basically the keeper is tied to the post (laughs) there's got to be a safety problem with that right i feel like that's a criminal minds in the making right Mm -hmm. and i and my personal favorite part of this is the game ends when the bladder is successfully punctured because that's what he's guarding right the bladder the bladder guardian i was so confused with that okay continue but i'll tell you why later on so giant stick bladder on top Right. sharpened end of their brooms correct mm-hmm. right bladder guardians tied to the he his yeah. his okay. he, he's tied to the pole he's, everybody say else tethered is, he's tethered to it sure that doesn't sound worse um everybody else has sharpened like the pencil tip of their brooms down to be sharp steak buffy the vampire slayer style and they're trying to ram their steak brooms into the bladder while he's trying to basically curse them, correct? And hexing them. Yeah. And it's the game ends when the bladder has been successfully punctured or the bladder guardian has either succeeded in hexing all of the opponents out of the running or collapsed from exhaustion. <laughs> it sounds like the world's worst game of tag. Yeah. It's kind so- of, I think of it more like a uh, King of the Hill kind of game. Ooh. I have a very serious question that should not be asked here. But there was a game. <laughs> there was a game we played when Matthew played, our brother played baseball, and we would run between the bleachers, and it was like ghost, ghost, ghost something. Ghost, ghost around the house? I don't know. It wasn't ghost, ghost around the house. It was something we played between the bleachers. Where, and I thought my kid where t- at? Give me a visual. What, what kind of... 
at a baseball whatever park, and I can't tell you what name it is because I've been away for too long. But we used to play with those redheaded, miserable children. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> the no, worst part that is that must not be named. It's not affiliated with anyone, <laughs> and does not always associate and and believe. It was his coach's kids. And they were horrible we love children. They happened people. to be redheaded. <laughs> Luke knows it. That's why he's giggling so hard. And we wouldn't play it. Those but horrible anyways. redheaded children. <laughs> <laughs> they were. I'm sorry. That was a very lovely snicket thing. <laughs> that that was hilarious. I'm sorry. Oh Anyways, God. let's get back to it. My question about the particular book we're talking about is the Swiven Hog. It's like the last one mentioned. Oh, is a different yes. a different game. Yes. It's a different Swiven game, hog. right? Uh-huh, so, they're backwards. Um, it involved a bladder, usually a pig's. A player set backwards on their brooms and battled the bladder backwards and forwards across the hedge. Um, the first player to reach 50 points was the winner. But you broke a whole bunch of these. How many dead pigs are needed for this game? It was my question. This okay, is why when Melissa... So it's, so it's very possible that this bladder could exist throughout multiple games because they're not breaking the bladder. Um, it's Think of it as badminton. This is more okay? of a badminton or tennis type game, it seems okay. like. Okay, that's what this is. This is... I, I took the bladder out of a pig, which, if anyone has read um, The Little House in the Big Woods, is absolutely something people used to do. With Ian Stitchstock right? uses a dragon bladder, not a pig's bladder. Right. So That's when we were talking about bladders. This is where my thoughts went. I'm like, dang, how many pigs had to die for us to have some <laughs> entertainment? I right. was confused. So, Swimming Hodges, volleyball ish or tennis. Right. You get the point when it lands on the team. It's, a, it's a volley esque game. Yes. I I'm, I would be more concerned about the amount of dead dragons from playing Stitch Stock than I would be about the dead pigs from <laughs> um, Swim and Hodge. Well, because then we've also got Ang and Goin, which was... Thank you for saying that out loud. I didn't want to. Ang, Ang and Goin, uh, or Ang and Goin. And uh, it's, it looks like it's more of an Irish game, and it used the gallbladder of a goat. Um Four dead animals. Can't we kill one animal? Right. And different well, that was that's actually pretty historical. For like, that if it's not if it's not a rock, you're going to try to use a soft, fleshy thing that's not going to hurt you. If you're hitting it with a body Leather, part, right? Like, yeah. It's still, all all balls are pretty much made of some right some form, form of, of leather. Right. Or, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the players would take the dumb or ball and speed through a series of burning barrels set high in the air on stilts. The dom was to be thrown through the final barrel. The player who succeeded in getting the dom through the last barrel in the fastest time without having caught fire on the way was the winner. So this is more of an obstacle course type American Gladiators game, if you would. Get through the gauntlet without blazer or laser or taser shooting you with the nerf ball, right? I, my, the next... Next one is my favorite. Because, you know, it is the manliest of games. <laughs> I, I love I love the the Scottish uh, accent oh. that Andrew Lincoln puts on in oh, uh, yeah. in in this yeah. one. Mm-hmm. It's pretty good. I just think of uh, Dougal McKenzie reading it for oh, us. Oh, that's my man. He got a white. Oh yeah, some Dougal. So yeah, Kreath uh is yeah. Scottish, and is the probably the most dangerous of all the broom games it says well, the, duh. right yeah so players wore a cauldron strapped to the head at the sound of the horn or drum up to a hundred charmed rocks and boulders that had been hovering about a hundred feet above the ground began to fall to the earth the krayath players zoomed around trying to catch as many rocks as possible in their cauldrons considered by many wizards to be the supreme test of manliness and courage krayath enjoyed considerable popularity in the middle ages and i love that it was despite the huge number of fatalities that resulted from it the game was made illegal in 1762 and, th- and though magnus dent head mcdonald <laughs> spearheaded a campaign for its reintroduction oh, in the McDonald's. 1960s the ministry of magic refused to lift the ban so that's a great one too basically you're flying around trying to catch boulders and rocks on a cauldron that's strapped to the top of your head and, you know, Magnus Denthead McDonald, he gets it. <laughs> I mean, it's not a big deal, right? You right, right? Right. Take it off. Manly. Take an Advil. But, but it's the the Gaelic poem. The players assembled 12 fine hardy men. They strapped on their cauldrons, stood poised to fly. At the sound of the horn, they were swiftly airborne, but 10 of their number were fated to die. <laughs> <laughs> 
That does sound. I mean, won? did you have to survive to win it? Like, what if you died, but you had the most rocks in your kettle? You died. Sorry, bro. You out. Yeah. You're you're no uh, man among men. Lose, Sorry, only losers go. die. I just want to point out the only legends <laughs> never die. That's true. <laughs> the only game we haven't talked about is shunt bumps, which is basically jousting, but it's like it almost sounds like melee jousting. Right? It's not one to one. It's like everybody's all up there and I'm going to knock off as many people mm-hmm. as possible. Now Free I'm the only all. one that's still played, apparently. But only as kids. Yeah, like just play kids. that. I 100% believe we would have played that had we flying brooms as kids. Oh, one yeah. Person. That very much feels like those little, uh, I don't even know what to call them, those little scooter chair things that you'd sit on that had four mm-hmm. wheels underneath the little plastic. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking about. And uh, you just, I mean, you'd play ground soccer or whatever but yeah. you really were just beating the crap out of each other right that was the game <laughs> that was super fun <laughs> Definitely. so so that is the i'll say the extent of all of the non-quidditch broom games that we have in this book um and so then As personal favorite what are your personal favorites really quick <sighs> personal favorites abby did you I like already told you Krayath going yep the manliest of games. Oh, Melissa, which is your choice? I'm going to say it wrong. Anging, the, Ang, the, anging going. The one where you fly through the birding. That's a pretty good one. I do like that one. Stick stock would be interesting to see. It's a bit of a gladiator type game again. Mm-hmm. Uh, shunt bumps. That could be interesting to see. Swim and Hodge is fine. I'm going to go with the race, though. I think the race would be exciting with the dra- going through the dragon reservation. That'd be a... A pretty fun annual. I love that it's an annual thing too. You know, it's it's got that tradition going for it. So I, I like that. So the final part of part one here is the game from Queerditch Marsh, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and read the the earliest the earliest uh, excerpt that we have. <laughs> the excerpts below have been tr- have been translated from the badly spelled Saxon of the original. And so this comes from Gertie Kettle, who lived on Queerditch Marsh in the 11th century. And it says, Tuesday, hot. The lot from across the marsh have been at it again, playing a stupid game on their broomsticks. A big leather ball landed in my cabbages. I hexed the man who came for it. I'd like to see him fly with his knees on back to front. The great hairy hog. Tuesday, wet. Was out on the marsh picking nettles. Broomstick idiots playing again. Watched for a bit from behind a rock. They've got a new ball, throwing it to each other and trying to stick it in the trees at either end of the marsh. Pointless rubbish. The third excerpt. Tuesday. When Windy. Gwenog from came for nettle tea, then invited me out for a treat. Ended up watching those numbskulls playing their game on the marsh. That big Scottish warlock from up the hill was there. Now they've got two big heavy rocks flying around trying to knock them all off their broomsticks. Unfortunately, didn't happen while I was watching. Gwenog told me she often played herself. Went home in disgust. These extracts reveal much more than Gertie Kettle could have guessed, quite apart from the fact that she only knew the names of one of the days of the week. <laughs> I love that so much. Every every excerpt was a Tuesday. <laughs> Which, go I home, mean, Gertie. Go home, go say. home, Gertie. Go home, Gertie. Go home. She did. She did. Maybe she <laughs> only writes in her journal once a week. Yeah. That's what I wanted to Just point out, too. Maybe Tuesdays were for journal writing. The rest of the days of the week were for like actually butter, doing stuff. Like butter making and... Nettle growing. Pig slaughtering. <laughs> she, exactly. She had to get all those goat gallbladders. <laughs> yeah. For all their damn balls. But I also really like that in those excerpts, it talks about the big Scottish warlock from the hill. And that was the day that the rocks started flying around, right? And it even says that... Of course it was. Right. And it's like, maybe that was, you know, pulling in some of the uh, Kraeth Gyoen ideas of, hey, enchant rocks to be a part of this game too. So you see like this amalgamation of multiple sports coming together, which we all know how to play Quidditch a bit, Ed. That seems to be, okay, there's there's several things going on. So I like the natural progression of, okay, well, this is fun, but how do we do something else along with it to have like a cross idea going that makes it that much more interesting? Let me just go to Gertie's defense one more time. <laughs> 
So let's say that all these farmers, wizards, whatever they are, they get together on Tuesdays. Gertie's life, other than that, is very mundane. She tends to her cattle. Mm -hmm. They only play on Tuesdays. So she only plays on, or they only play on Tuesdays. So that's the only day which there's something to write about. Yeah, the excerpt. Yeah. So leave Gertie alone, okay? You go home. You you go home. (laughs) You go home, Gertie. Maybe... Like that's her way of venting her frustration is to write. And she write. is frustrated on two tu- on when they're playing. <laughs> like Tuesdays with Maury. Tuesdays with Gertie. <laughs> Tuesdays with Gertie. Oh, that's cute. All right, that's new. there's a song in there. It probably is. There probably is. We'll 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 work on that in post. So we get a little bit more information on let's see what all happens in this. Oh, we have a, a letter from Olaf uh to his cousin. Olaf. Goodwin from Norway to Olaf to Olaf Norway. sorry from Goodwin to his cousin Olaf in Norway talking about um, basically they were playing games this is I think a, a century later from mm-hmm. Gertie's uh, information that we get and there's a, clearly some teams forming and um, they their team ended up playing well and they got free mead for the night at the inn and um, by the way hmm Excellent prize, by oh, the way. Oh, quite, quite. That's a good one. Uh, I like that they have... Dragon Free, or whatever. Fyri? Dragon Free. Oh, Dragon dragon Fire? No, Dragon I know Fire, mean? Yeah, yeah, you know. Never mind. Continue. <laughs> I like that some of the players had position names, like the Catcher and the Bluter. Mm-hmm. The Bluter. Mm-hmm. I liked those. Yeah, and again, that's, again, what makes this feel like it was researched well because terms change in sports over time. And so these are some of the positions that they're not exactly what we know them, but you know, the catcher was likely the old term for the chaser, the bluter, undoubtedly the bludger itself. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's, it's showing a pretty natural progression that JK, I mean, kind of worthy wisp, uh, is, is <laughs> showing for us. I will just say to that note, I think it is wonderfully written from a muggle perspective, a muggle and sports enthusiast perspective. Gotcha. Yes. Yep. Um, like there's a lot of, I feel like there has to be a lot of sports background knowledge yeah. in order to pull yes. this off. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You can't fake some of the things that are being worked no. into this, just the nature of how it goes and how fans are and how mm-hmm. sports develop. And, right. And yeah. even like, as we get later on, how fanatical people are about different components. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> we're getting there. Um, so my final thought on this is through this through the two different excerpts and letters that we got, we're starting to see the game grow. Right? I mean, we've got people from Norway, we've got Scotland and England clearly involved, and so it's the words clearly getting around, and it seemed like it's also becoming a little bit more organized in the fact that there are specific teams that play the other teams and it's not just oh a group that showed up on the marsh to mess around a bit right we're we're a century in it's it's moving it's it's progressing so our next part part three of our episode here include chapter four the arrival of the golden snitch and chapter five anti-muggle precautions melissa i'm gonna start with you hashtag modesty forever hashtag right. Snidget lives matter. Snidget yes. lives matter. Yeah, I like. I love what she does here. Right. The so I'm. I'm just going to read you part of her alert. Not all of mm-hmm. it. I'm going to start. Um. Uh, here we go. Well, Prue, you know how I am about snidget hunting and what I get like when my temper goes up. I ran onto the pitch and screamed, "Chief Bragg, this is not a sport. Let the snidget go free and let us watch the noble game of Quidditch, which we have all come to see." If you believe me, Prue, all that brute did was laugh and throw the empty bird cage at me. Well, I saw red Prue. I really did. When that poor little snidget flew my way, I did a summoning charm. You know how good my summoning charms are, Prue. Of course, it was easier for me to aim properly, not being mounted on a broomstick at the time. The little bird came zooming into my hand. I stuffed it down the front of my robes and ran like a fury. Well, they caught me, but not before I got out the crowds and released the snidget. Chief Bragg was very angry, and for a moment, I thought I'd end up a horned toad or worse, but luckily his advisor calmed him down, and I was only fined ten galleons for disrupting the game. Of course, I've never had ten galleons in my life, so that's the old home gone. I'll be coming to 
you shortly. Luckily, they didn't take the hippogriff. And I'll tell you this, Prue, Chief Bragg would have lost my vote if I had one. Your loving sister, Modesty. I will say <laughs> that I feel like I have an aunt, Modesty, who would do this in a heartbeat at any type of official gaming. It could be the Olympics. It could be the World Series. If there was an animal in harm, Aunt Karen would be out there. Make, taking the stand. And 100%. shoving it in her shirt, being like, F you all, I'm out of here. Like, mm -hmm. You're not hurting this bird. So good for you, Modesty. I am yeah. glad there are people out there that like birds. So I'm going to, just for supplementary information, read the Snidget entry from Fantastic Beasts because it's worth adding in here, I think. Uh, Mi Ministry of Magic Classification 4X, footnote, the Golden Snidget gains a 4X rating not because it is dangerous, but because several severe penalties are attached to its capture or injury. So it's very protected, like we just learned a little bit after... Um, modesty's letter there, but the golden snidget is an extremely rare protected species of bird, completely round with a very long, thin beak and glistening jewel-like red eyes. The golden snidget is an extremely fast flyer that can change direction with uncanny speed and skill, owing to the rotational joints of its wings. The golden snidget's feathers and eyes are so highly prized that it was once that at one time it was in danger of being hunted to extinction extinction by wizards. The danger was recognized in time and the species protected. The notable, the most notable factor being the substitution of the golden snitch for the snidget in the game of Quidditch. Footnote, anyone interested in the role played by the golden snitch in the development of the game of Quidditch is advised to consult Quidditch Through the Ages by Kettleworthy Wisp, Wiz Hard Books, 1952. And snidget sanctuaries exist worldwide. That's awesome. So there's that. I like that it references back to the book that we're reading right now as well. I'm a big fan that, oh, what was that guy's name? Bragg? Yeah. Chief Bragg. Um, offered 150 galleons to the player who caught it. Mm -hmm. And then later on, you get, it's 150 points, right? Mm -hmm. So like, there's still that history in there of this. Very much in sports, I have found, like I told Luke and Melissa the other day, I was down a rabbit hole of sporting history. Um, there's kind of almost a sinister beginning of a lot of sports, like some things that you don't necessarily want to think that's the how, dirt, dirty underside of like like how it started or how it whatever. But 150 galleons to this bird being captured is now how you get your 150 points. Um, same as some other sports where you get a goal using a certain ball, as we call it now, that might have been a decapitated human mm -hmm. centuries ago. Um, and, and it's true. Like it's so, what's the word? Macabre? Is mm -hmm. that the right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes. It's so dark and, um. Morbid. It can be. Yeah, it's terrible. Dark and twisty. Did you just say that's terrible? Man, Tur that's terrible. So terrible. <laughs> Thanks, Charles Barkley. You're welcome. But, um, I'm a really great basketball player, you know, but, uh. <laughs> I'm really good in Space Jam. However, I like that there's this dark side to Quidditch that we all love, and it's this joyous game now, but back in the day, we were killing poor or catching these innocent lives for 150 galleons. I also really like that JK works in another, like, righteous thing of hunting mm -hmm. for sport is... Not okay. Not really okay. Like, it's... Especially if you're doing it to such extent that it's, I mean, you're going to lose the species. Like, that's that's awful, right? And it, so I like that she she does it often with many, many things, as we've chatted about. And this is a, another kind of sleight of hand, like a little backhand uh, reason to, to work something in. America, mm -hmm. you know? I'm cool with that, JK. I like it. So I'm just going to throw out there, there have been a lot of conversations on this show over the past four books on our dislike of the scoring system. It's, in it's ridiculous. It's not a team sport. I, I, I'm with you, but I appreciate that I can see the development of how that happened. That's, yes, continue. Not that, not that I agree with it per se, because again, it's a terrible scoring system, but at least it developed organically. That it wasn't just somebody once upon a time saying, I know. Oh, man. I'm and make 150 points. Later on, later on, we'll get to it. Um, never mind. Later on. Like, so just like keep yeah. that in the back of your head that 
I like that it's justified on how that happened. Not that it's okay. Saving innocent lives. Okay, fine. I'm cool. Uh, we're good now, I guess. That was that was certainly a way to couch it in a reason that we wouldn't be so irate at why it doesn't make sense. Like, hey, let's write this book <laughs> and give it a reason that people will not hate the scoring people system anymore. Stop asking me that question. <laughs> yeah, which is that's fine. Good. Like, that's yeah. very much a... Uh, what uh, really JK or what would we call it originally? Come on, JK. Like, <laughs> that, on, like, JK. like a rewrite, like basically yeah. make it finagle it in to justify it, which every author does it. Like if you write a book series, <laughs> an innocent animal to do it. Fine. Pull at the heartstrings. Right. Okay. Fine. All right. Fine. We'll, we'll stand back. Fine. There's a reason. <laughs> we'll just, we'll just like it quietly. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we'll just like it. Even though we get, there's a just reason for it. Right. All right, next so, chapter. Next chapter, anti-muggle precautions. You're clapping, Melissa. You seem excited about this. Do you want to go for it? Um, well, why don't you do your thought first? Because mine really sort of ties it all up. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's a really, I'll say, slow rollout of regulation to prevent muggles from spotting the flyers, right? It it talks about how, you know, they, they really need to play these games in deserted marshes. And, you know, you need to try to do your best to play it. It's advisable to play at night, which would be probably difficult, I would think. You know, make sure you're trying to use muggle repelling charms. Um, and then uh, later on, they had to actually implement some true regulation where it was like, no, you can't play anywhere 50 miles within a, a muggle town. And then it got worse, and you can't play within 100 miles of a town. I really it got worse. And it was fine. <clears throat> Quidditch should not be played, quote, anywhere near any place where there is the slightest chance that a muggle might be watching or will see how well you can play whilst chained to a dungeon wall, which might be my favorite worded piece of legislation ever. Because <laughs> that's like the law, as in if you do this, here is the consequence. Chained to a dungeon wall. That's not just harsh. I think that's fine. Totally fair. I feel like some of this, this, the slow roll, if you will, of laws is very similar to how um, the government determined beings that we read in Fantastic Beasts. Mm -hmm. also. It's because you kept having people push the limits. Mm -hmm. They weren't goblins this time, but people are, are testing the boundaries of what it is. That if people weren't testing it, then the, the the lesser laws would be okay. But because there are people out there pushing it, then they have to have harsher regulations. And I think in the case of Fantastic Beasts, those harsher regulations were very important. I think they needed a better definition of beast. In this case, if people would have followed the first rule, then like we wouldn't have to have this severe legislation. And that also gives it the air of realism, right? Where it's... Uh -huh. Not people just necessarily, not necessarily just testing it. Certainly, I think some people were, but also people being ignorant of the reason why the rule is in place, like choosing not to care. And that's going to happen when something gains popularity and you have more people being involved that don't understand the reasons for why certain things are, are going on. Because now we're in 1362, 1368, 1419. Remember, we started in the 11th century. So we're 400, 500 years into this being a game. And it's certainly getting more popularity. And that's where you, it, it's a growing problem, right? It, and when you have that many people playing, there aren't that many deserted marshes. So you have to start figuring out ways of doing that, right? Yes. Abby, do you have any thoughts on the anti-mogul precautions? So one of... It's really not necessarily pertaining to Quidditch. It's more about my love that the fact that these books have used the mile or like, I don't even know what you call this. It's not the metric system. It's whatever system we use. We crazy Americans. The and, customary. Sure. There we go. Um, they don't switch to the metric system. And I wonder about our European counterparts. Do they really understand how long a mile is? Do you understand how long a kilometer is? Oh, yeah, because I know a 5K is about 3.2 miles. So if you say five kilometers, it's not close to like five miles. Um, and I also lived in a country for four years that used the metric system. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder, like, what, what do they say? 50 miles? Mm -hmm. How far that truly is? Like, that is a 
far distance of a muggle civilization, it has to be extremely hard to find spots to be able to play that meet these qualifications. Yeah. And and maybe not. Maybe you can do like high up in mountains or whatever. But if you're around a town where there's multiple people to be pulling these high quality athletes, you have to be around some type of population. There's also the major benefit of being able to apparate, right? That, I mean, and port true. keys and magical instantaneous transportation, right? But That's a pretty mi- major benefit. 50 miles is a pretty far way. All right. Hang on, I, I got it. I got it. Ready? Team night bus. We all have yep. team night buses. Yes. Right? Yep. I mean, I'm, I'm cool with it. I just love that miles are used and that's it. This, we can go on. This chapter does finish with, nowadays, Quidditch teams do not play locally, but travel to pitches which have been set up by the Department of Magical Games and Sports, where adequate anti-muggle security is maintained. As Zacharias Mumps so rightly suggested 600 years ago, Quidditch pitches, Quidditch pitches are safest on deserted moors. Not easy to get to, easy enough to fly around, right? Makes sense. Beautiful, wonderful, and most majestic places on earth, but I digress. I, I really want to see a team night bus now. Like, I, 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 we need to make that be a, a thing. We, we need to do some, some you art. You have your, your team bus. Okay. Yeah, we need some team buses. All right, team buses, here they come. I got you. <laughs> yeah, clearly, some are triple deckers, some are like double triple deckers, like s- s- just like together. And some are like uh, the Bad News Bears bus. Like right. imagine a bus that they would be on. <laughs> like it's just a van that's like had a flat tire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. Any final thoughts on part three? All right, let's move on to part four, which is going to be chapter six. Changes in Quidditch since the 14th century. So this is one of the longer chapters that we have. Um, and this really kind of takes us through most of really the rest of this before we get into the teams and such, right? So it's really like talking about all the different parts. Yeah. This talks about rules and all, all sorts of things. So lots to talk about here. Uh, Abby's pointing at her brain. Like she's about to erupt. Bring so. back our baskets. <laughs> outrage. It's I love outrageous. it. Any change in any sport ever. Outrage. This is the worst thing that's happened ever. VAR replay. <laughs> yeah, replay VAR. Like it bring back our baskets. Well, and then at one point when they were talking about the stooging, right? Oh, and, that, those are my two favorite things. <laughs> right. Like the article with the stooging and how you can't um oh, where is that in in here? Our oh. chasers aren't cheating. That was that was the stunning reaction of Quidditch fans across Britain last night when the when the so-called stooging penalty was announced by the Department of Magical Sport Games and Sports last night. So my favorite part was the little boy. The oh six- yeah. One freckle-faced six-year-old left the hall in tears. I love stooging. He sobbed to the Daily Prophet. Me and my dad, me and me dad like watching them keepers flattened. I don't want to go to Quidditch no more. <laughs> I feel like when they change some of the fighting rules in hockey. In hockey? Like yes. Exactly. That's exactly what I was thinking. It was like, oh man, because I used to live for the fights in hockey, and now like they happen, but they're not nearly as cool as they were 20, 30 years ago, you know? Am I right? And oh, like, you're I'm, absolutely right. Yeah. I'm just making sure I didn't like dream that or something. Like there was rules for that. I love this. I love the clap back at the rule changes. Oh yeah, absolutely. And you guys are hitting right on the head. I, I those were the two main things that I had highlighted to the because they're also like these really cool articles, right? They're I think the ones from the Daily Prophet, they're both from the Daily Prophet. One's in 1883 and one's in 1884. Okay, back to back. A lot of regulation going on in the 1880s in Quidditch, I can tell you that much. They were with it. They yeah. were they they were dealing with some growing pains. Um, and so there was, it became a, we'll say, a tradition of one of the teams to start setting their baskets on fire. Because this is before the scoring hoops were introduced. Uh, this is the introduction of the scoring hoops. And... Um, because of those fires and how dangerous it was and how easy it was for muggles to see and things, they decided to make it. And also the size discrepancy between a, how many different size baskets there are. They had to come up with a standardized scoring hoop, right? And uh, I just I just love the backlash. We're not burning them. Don't exaggerate, said an irritable looking department departmental representative last night when asked to comment. Baskets, as you may have noticed, come in different sizes. We have found it impossible to standardize basket size so as to make goalposts throughout Britain equal. 
Surely you can see it's a matter of fairness. I mean, there's a team up in Martin. They've got these minuscule little baskets attached to the opposing team's post. You couldn't even get a grape in them and up and up their own. And they've got these great wicker caves swinging around. It's not on. We've settled on a fixed hoop size and that's it. Everything nice and fair. Doesn't that just seem like Percy, like in the best way? Like I, I literally, you read, and I just not thought about it. Like, um, we have found it impossible to standard standardize basket size. And my thought was, well, maybe if Percy had been there, right, right, could have written a report that would have helped. It's similar to the Stooging introduction at the very end of this article. It says, "Won't be the same without baskets," said one apple-cheeked old wizard sadly. I remember when I were a lad, we used to set them on fire for a laugh during to match. You can't do you can't do that with goal hoops. All the fun's gone. <laughs> it's, it's just like abandoning the game because this one slight change was made. That happens. Like people get so infuriated, yeah. and then it just becomes normal. Like then you just you just keep playing. <laughs> like as long as it's not super detrimental to the game, the game will go on. I don't know. It's kind of why I don't believe the American League of Baseball. Oh yeah, let's oh let's not get started on the designated my, hitter rule. The, well, so my thing with the stooging was more like. The collide, the colliding with the catcher or sliding into the second yeah. baseman was much more. I'm like, what do you mean I can't slide into the second baseman? I have to break up the play. That's ridiculous to take that away from me. Mm-hmm. I'm not happening. Uh, happening. I'm, I'm, I'm not happening with this. I'm not. I'm not happening with. I'm not happy. Like there will be a collision at the plate. Nope, you're out. If there's a collision, you must make an attempt to slide or like that's ridiculous. Now we've adjusted. It's the way it is. Things have progressed and gone on. I just, uh, Muggle World, the way this is written to me just resonated so poignantly because what do you mean I can't break up the play at second? Mm -hmm. Cleats up at second? Really? Fine. Like it's outrageous. Soccer. Headball. Soccer. Same thing. Well, the handball. Anybody watch the Manchester United Liverpool game today? Hey, oh, not even on purpose. No apps. Guys goal completely called back because the hand was not in the proper. Soccer is crazy right now. So I understand <laughs> like the ludicrousness. Is that That's the correct way to even say that of how frustrating fans feel with these new rules and changes. Ridiculous. Yeah. Like even even like in football, too. Right. There's there's this huge going on about. Are we talking safety. about American football? Amer- American football. I don't so, watch that. I know, but, okay. but like the the helmet to helmet contact, right? I mean, it's they're being very protective of these players, which is a good cause, right? You you have right. these players that retire at thirty two and have mental problems, like, yeah. post concussion problems, and like yeah, let's work on that. Like when they can't function as normal humans after they play, like that's probably a problem. But then they, it's almost like you have to overregulate and then try to draw back to where it's actually at a reasonable level, right? And you're too protective at first, and then you, you ease off and find that delicate balance. But it, it happens in every sport. Honestly, it's really more the fans that have the problem than the players, because typically the players are aware, at least on a professional level, mm-hmm. players are aware of why. What those- the outcomes of those are. And, and, and like the reasoning behind it, right? Like, so there's a little more understanding. And so they just, this is the way it is, but it's those of us who are not as well versed or educated within like the minutia of mm-hmm. the sport, like in and the around, ongoing effects. Yeah. In yeah. and around the reality of the, the consequences. Right. right? Mm-hmm. So in this section, we also get the kind of evolution of the balls, the, the quaffle itself, which, uh, Yep, was always made of leather, um, and it originally had quaffle holes, uh, and then they developed gripping charms in 1875. That was another thing. Like, we've never talked about that within the seven books that I have read, mm-hmm. these gripping charms. Mm-hmm. I mean, is that like pine tar on your hands? I mean, like, what is up with this? A, a bit, right? It seems like yeah. it. I mean... Because like, I'm gonna do a Derek. What was that guy's name? Scott Derek ah, threw the pine tar hat up into the stands. No, you know what I'm talking about. It's cool. You'll that, get it in a minute. That was. Um, um. I'll think about it. Um, yeah, I know. The other really cool innovation to the quaffle I really always loved was the. Um, uh, where do they call it? Where do they call it? Uh, basically, the the slowing of it falling. Right where they. 
they put a charm on it so that because they were tired of diving down continually and wherever they missed the catch. Um, and so the witch Daisy Pettifold had the idea of witching the quaffle so that if it dropped, it would fall slowly towards the earth. So as as though sinking through water, this became known as the Pettifold quaffle. And that's what's still used today. So like that was always like the OK, well, if you drop it, like you're going to be constantly falling down, like flying down and catching it. That was always one like you basically cut the rate of falling in half. And one of the rules states that a player is not allowed to touch the ground unless it is a timeout or the game is over. Mm -hmm. like, that's a very explicit rule. So what do you do with the ball is there? Right. Yeah. Slop. So the bludgers, we kind of already saw some of the evolution of that from enchanted rocks. And then there's also a description of how a historian can tell if they're cannonballs or uh, enchanted leather or lead uh, bludgers. Uh, that, that's pretty funny as well uh, to read that. But it says the faint indentations of magically reinforced beater's bats are visible. And one can see the distinct ha distinctive hallmarks of manufacture by a wizard as opposed to a muggle. The smoothness of line, the perfect symmetry. A final clue was the fact that each and every one of them whizzed around my study and attempted to knock me to the floor when released from its case. Ah, yes. It is a bit of a clue. <laughs> I just, in general, the the humor, same as Fantastic Beasts, is just so intertwined so well through this entire book. Like, there's just funny little bits of history. I love it. It's it's so enjoyable to sit down and read or listen to. Um, Does that make you, oh, the Golden Snitch? The Golden Snitch, which we kind of talked about. They eventually, Bodman Moore in 1884, created a, a Golden Snitch uh, to... It was from Godric's Hollow, right? The guy who invented it? Bowman Wright? Uh, it doesn't say that here. Bowman Wright of Godric's Hollow, I thought. Bowman Moore. Yeah. No. The invention of the Golden Snitch is credited to the wizard Bowman Wright of Godric's Hollow, page 14. That was back in the chapter oh, on the uh, snitch. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to like. Sorry. Back yeah, I. You were right, Ab. Yes, Point you are correct. Boom. This, this is talking about a. On Bodeman Moore in 1884, yeah, there was a golden. I, no, I I was entering. I was glancing at it without, and it was close enough that I was. I apologize. Anyway, no, you're good. There's a tale, and I actually had a point to talk about this specific line, so I'm glad I misread that, so I didn't miss this. Um, there's a tale that a golden snitch evaded capture for six months on Bo on Bodeman Moore in 1884. Both teams finally giving up in disgust at their seeker's poor performances. So, I have. I'm going to call it. A knit to pick with this a little bit, and uh, a if you knit. Uh, <laughs> let's let's pick this knit, and uh, so it's funny because this specifically came up at LeakyCon, which I it just got back from, uh, and that was what a week ago now. There was a trivia there, mm -hmm. and one of the questions was how long was the longest Quidditch match ever? Good question, right? Yes. I in my study for going through Quidditch of the Ages was like, well, I mean it's six months, right? We just read the line. Six six months. But in if you remember Harry first learning about Quidditch in the chapter right. Quidditch in book one, there was Oliver Wood says he I think he says, I think the longest match was three months. That's what Oliver Wood says. He says, I think the longest match was three months. So the answer that they were looking for in trivia was three months, and I contest that. Did you? <laughs> no, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't actually at the trivia. I heard about this afterwards because oh. someone asked me when we were out at the brewery with, meeting up with the MuggleCast team, which they are awesome. Check them out. Um, but I just met a couple people there and was talking about how incredibly awesome Fantastic Beasts the movies are. And we got talking about just the trivia that they had gone to. And I said, what was one of the harder questions? And the one that they got wrong, one of their very few, they were they were really smart, uh, was how long was the longest Quidditch match? And I said, six months to them. And they go, that's not even close. And I was like, now hold on just a minute. For some reason, six months is sticking in my head. Hold and then on the, on the flight back, I was listening through this again. And I heard that. I said, that's why I said six months. I knew it. There was a reason. Now, I can, I can argue on behalf of the question that this was not a completed Quidditch match. But it was a Quidditch match that lasted for six months until both teams forfeited, which is, in the rules, one of the ways you can end a Quidditch match. That's not forfeiting. That's... Both teams agreed to end. What do they call it? Like concession. They both yeah. concede, and that's yeah. fine. And it's still a match. So I, 
Rule number seven states a game of Quidditch ends only when the golden snitch has been caught or by mutual consent of the two team captains. One assumes that this was consent of the two team captains to end it. Yeah. Did either of you pull open the part in book one that has that? I, I'm looking for it. I don't have my book. Like to I'll see if I can get it on the Kindle book. real quick. But I, I'm pretty sure that it also just, the way it's worded, Oliver doesn't know. He he he, he knows that it's about that. But I just contested a little bit. All right, we Definitely have in the chapter Quidditch. I believe so. I have that chapter open as well. I'm looking for my orange highlighted area because I'm sure I highlighted it in orange. Actually, it might be it's a, it's the chapter before because Quidditch is the first Quidditch match, I believe. Yeah, that's why I was. This does mention that referees had been known to vanish and turn up three months later in the Sahara Desert, which is also mentioned in Quidditch through the ages at one point. Mm-hmm. So it's before they fight the troll. It's before Halloween. It's right after. There we go. I think the record is three months. They had to keep bringing on substitutes for the players so the players could get some sleep. So he says, I think the record is three months. He doesn't know. That is a bad trivia question, in my opinion. It's also incorrect. This is a terrible thing for your dog to do also. <laughs> At least the, the, the pages are safe. Uh, to explain what happened, there are a few pages torn out of Abby's book that have bite marks from the edges in a four-piece My piece dog ate book. my whole part. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that was the, the nit that I wanted to pick with the trivia that I was uh, exposed to recently. So Nicked pit. I, I feel like I've I, effectively picked this nit. You nicked picked. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, anything else in this section? I feel like there's there's still more. Um, there's the different rules here, correct? Anyone have a favorite rule? Ooh, favorite rule. Um, I'll, I'll quickly read them off. Uh, we've got all the fouls. There's blagging, blatching, blurting, bumping, cobbing, flacking, haversacking, quaffle pocking, snitch, <laughs> snitch nip, and stooging. <laughs> I, I love stooging. <laughs> I would like to point out that there's only that there are 700 Quidditch fouls are listed that um, all of them occurred during the final of the first ever World Cup in 1473. The full list of fouls is never been made available to the public because we don't want to give people ideas. We don't want people to people might get ideas. <laughs> so and good. 90% of the fouls listed are impossible as long as the ban on using wands against the opposing team is upheld. My my I, favorite. I, sorry, Melissa, you go on. I was going to say, my. I, I really like that. It's just don't use your wand, right? Like mm -hmm. I, I'm a fan of that. I do like, however, the footnote in this that the right to carry a wand at all times was established by the International Confederation of Wizards in 1692 when Muggle persecution was at its height and wizards were planning their retreat into hiding. So that it is okay to have your wand on you on the Quidditch pitch. Mm -hmm. It is just to use it in regards of the game itself right which ties back to game th or sorry year three quidditch for harry which we always question why did harry have his wand on him when he sent the patronus charm at pretend dementor malfoy like why was that okay mm -hmm. well why they're allowed to have their wands on them at all times yeah. So I like that that kind of, it, it helped to justify to me why that happened. Yeah. And that's another one of those, I think that probably is why it came into the book here. Like, hey, we have to justify why that happened because mm -hmm. I'm sure people questioned that. But I will say that never really bothered me much just because it it's almost like a personal safety thing. And I like that that's a little bit how it's like, hey, you're a wizard. You have the right to carry your wand at all times. Like as long as you don't get it confiscated or lose right. your right to that. You had something you were going to favorite? So, yes, my favorite is actually the first one listed here, um, blagging. Mm -hmm. uh, as a slow runner myself, I have seen this wonderful college, girls' college excerpt of soccer or football, if you must, where a college girl soccer player rips a girl down by her ponytail because she's just faster and she's going to score and just yank and <laughs> gets the foul. Yeah. So the whole seizing of an opponent's broom tail to slow or hinder, that's my favorite. <laughs> it might be worth it every now and then. Okay? I'm sorry. Didn't did that happen in book three? Yeah. Draco did that to Harry's and Madam Hooch was, I think she went on to say, I've never in all my years seen <laughs> such like awful play. Like, it's Ooh, clearly one of the rules that's been published. <laughs> so, like, yes. a little surprised How by that. How dare you? 
Um, yeah, there's some there's some good ones. I do like that excessive use of elbows is just called cobbing. That's just it seems so Brit- like such a British way of saying el- using elbows. Keep your elbows down, right? Yeah, um, uh, I like that. There's a specific rule against attacking an opponent with an axe. <laughs> right? <laughs> is this the <laughs> chapter where we must have done that once? Oh, that's great. Can we talk about the referees in this chapter? Because yeah. this chapter is this. I yeah. really like that the referees have to prove, not just say, "Oh, yeah, sure." We have to prove that they will not jinx, curse, or um, or like, or curse any player under severe pressures. Mm-hmm. Like that is a very difficult thing. Have you ever been to any child sports ever? Oh my yeah. gosh! Yes, to the point where I'm usually the parent saying, "Let's let them play, guys." <laughs> Let's <laughs> let them play. Good Let's, job. I said just like two weeks ago. Let, let, good job, guys. You're doing great out there. Way to go. It's fine. I, how the game is going. I'm the mom going, you're doing good. You're doing great. Keep going. You're me, fine. Me too. The only person I know that got a red card after a game one time. I'm the mom that's saying, it's great. Good work. <laughs> you'll get them next time yep exactly all right moving on moving on well i have i have one more thought here and it i think it has to do partly with the very first section in chapter six uh the pitch yes well and maybe it doesn't specifically say it there I'm, I'm quickly reading through it again that talks mostly about the goalposts and the size of the field um uh-huh. But I believe at some point it says that you can't fly outside of the perimeter circle, right? Which is something that we've talked about. It's bothered Melissa that you shouldn't, like, even, like, especially specifically in the movies where they're flying around the the crowd towers and underneath. So, like, Mm -hmm. that was, it specifically talks about that here. And right in the referees section also, it says at professional matches, the referee is assisted by officials who stand around the boundaries of the pitch to ensure that neither players nor balls stray over the outer perimeter. But I felt like there was somewhere else in, in this section. Did you find it? I did. It's under the rules. It's literally number one, though. There is no limit imposed on the height to which a player may rise during a, the game. He or she must not stray over the boundary lines of the pitch. Should a player fly over the boundary, his or her team must surrender the quaffle to the opposing team. Yeah, I, I was looking for it in fouls because I, I didn't realize there was a rules and then fouls Wait, section does separately. That, does that um, mean the same for a seeker? He doesn't have a ball. It's like a chaser who has the quaffle in so his hand. So it hands. sounds like the snitch is bewitched to stay within the perimeter. Right. So if he wants to milly nilly all over the place, that's fine. No, no, no player, no player cross fly over the boundary. It doesn't say fly over with the ball. It says no, it says should a player fly over the boundary. The seeker is the player. He can't go outside the boundary. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Another thought I had. I thought it was interesting that why these weren't very good. One. Another reason why the movies weren't very good. They did not accurately adapt it. It's, well, I also think that a lot of the things with Quidditch, there does seem to be some unfair scoring. And the whole idea of like the field, as I would call it, or the pitch, the boundaries are just not respected at all. Mm-hmm. So why even have it? Just I also throw thought some balls it was in the air and go. Very interesting that the keeper originally played just like an extra chaser position and then just like like a wandering chaser, right? A ro- roaming goalie is what, <laughs> That's it, it, what I was just going to say. Roaming goalie. Yeah. And <laughs> it seems like they almost made rules that they can't do that. And I, I don't like that limitation. Like, I think you should have the option to do whatever. And, uh, well, and I guess you probably do, but smart Quidditch play and strategy has evolved over, over time. time. Right. Like, one would assume that. A goalie could come out. Well, just like hockey, yeah. your goalie can come out, but for the most part, you're going to keep the goalie in the goal because <laughs> they're a be- smart, a better use of their skill set to keep there than it is to have them. Right. They're not trained in that as I well. I do feel like there is a yardage it, or a foot mark about how long the Quidditch pitch is. It, is it there 500? is. It's in the, it's 500 by 180. Feet? Yes. Five, okay. Yards. So that's what? Yards. Or is it? 500 yards. That's what I'm asking. Like how Five, many? You're right. 500 feet. 500 feet long and 180 feet wide. Small so circle approximately. Two feet in diameter in the middle. Melissa, tell me that in football fields. It's one and Five. a half. It uh, one and two thirds long. Okay. Oh, oh, just under two. Feet, 100. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's like double. 
but I don't know with 180. It's I don't know uh, just long. under two. Yeah, that's fine. I just was wondering. I didn't know if it was 500 like, yards long. I, that's what I was asking, actually. 500 <laughs> yards or 500 feet. Because 500 yards is extremely big. But we also know when we learn more about the brooms, which we're not to yet, they go pretty fast. Like, that, you can cover 500 was, yards pretty quickly on, at the speeds that we're talking about. Like, is it that either way would have been fine with me? Mm -hmm. I just was wondering because i couldn't exactly remember yeah in the in the keepers section it does just say that eventually uh keepers were advised to remain within the scoring areas so it doesn't say that though mm -hmm. keepers may fly out of this area and attempt to intimidate opposing chasers or head them off early um i feel like there was one more thing that i didn't really care for and it was one of the rules that the Chaser can't save it from behind the net, behind yeah, the hoop. You not? can't punch through to save it. And you also can't score backwards. Like if it's a hoop, I feel like you should be able to score from either side. That's just me. Once they went from baskets, that should open up scoring opportunities from either side of the of I the also hoop. feel like I guess if you're a basketball player, you can't put your hand through the hoop. To yeah, stop but we're also not dealing with gravity the same way. Yes. Now if you think back to all right, all right, ready? You remember the old game from the Aztec civilization, right? And we, we, we had a big demonstration of it in the movie El Dorado, if you remember that. And they would hit it off their hips, and it was a horizontal hoop up on the side of a wall. It could go through either way. I think as long as you have a hoop and it's not vertically oriented, you should be able to score from either side. My assumption is that's a holdover rule from when it was baskets. And it just so seems like that would have been that because it was traditionally a basket, that is the direction with which you can score. Just because they, they removed the baskets not to not for scoring purposes, but for size regulation. Therefore, like a pretend basket can be there. Do you know what I mean? Like it's yeah. a I, I'm sure that's I get it. the rationale behind it. I agree that that's why it is. I don't agree that that's so the way it should be. To prevent scoring. Like it's a lot harder to defend from both sides. Oh, sure. Punch through. Be better. That would I, be think, would I think if you, did, if you allowed one, you'd have to allow the other. If you can, if you allow yeah, scoring, absolutely. Sides, you have to allow the punch through. Right. It just becomes harder to judge, right? How far does the ball to go through to for it to count? Does that have to fully cross the plane or is it if it crosses the plane of the, you know, it, it, it definitely gets trickier. I agree. It's yes. worth questioning. VAR. VAR. <laughs> so let's go ahead and move on to part five. One of the more, the most fun sections in this book, I think. And this is chapter seven, Quidditch teams of Britain and Ireland. Oh man. There's, there's some great teams in here. I, I'm just going to run through each team. Does go that for it. Go for good? it. Yep. Can I, before you start, yeah. I have a question. Like this is my only thought before the actual teams are named. So the league condenses, right? We're like, hey, we're this thing and we're going to go down to 13 teams. How does the number 13 get picked for the best amount of teams in the league? Yeah, I don't know. How? It could have been. It could have been. So this this is the number that was selected in 1674 when the league was established, right? At mm -hmm. that time, the 13 best teams. So maybe this was like, hey, you guys have been consistently putting a team out. or But why, but why 13? Because... How do you even put up a bracket ship for that? Somebody, the number one team doesn't have to play in the first round. Well, like, look at how they delineate their money system, Abby. It's I, I get it, <laughs> but thirteen such a bad number in the Wizarding yeah, World. It's that like to sixteen, you could have groups of four. That'd be so much easier. Oh, sure. It's not supposed to be easy. This is Wizarding stuff. Yeah, you it's got always miles, it's always so. odd. It's always odd. Mission <laughs> difficult, Mr. Hunt. Okay, that's it. <laughs> you guys continue on about this because I'm done after that. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I'm I'm gonna. Just say a team if you've got a comment. Otherwise, if not, I'll wait a few seconds to move on to the next one. Appleby Arrows. Okay. Bally Castle Bats. Go Bats. The Barney, Bar Barney says, bats. I'm just batty about butterbeer. <laughs> I like that. Here we go. K or Philly Catapults. I will say that their choice of vertical stripes are very appeasing to the human form. Of light Which green and scarlet. Mm-hmm. Um, they also, like, this was the team of Dangerous Di Llewellyn, who was eaten by a chimera. Mm -hmm. It happens. That's quite the demise. I th now, I think that was actually mentioned in the chimera 
uh, section in Fantastic Beasts. Maybe not. I know it yeah. talks about the... Anyway, continue. I really like continue. there is now a Dangerous Die commemorative medal awarded at the end of each season for the league player who has taken the most exciting and foolhardy risks during the game. So the biggest idiot gets a reward. Right, yeah. <laughs> foolhardy risks. Right. Did the Chimera say anything about eating Guy Llewellyn? It, it, it talks about... Uh, a wizard an unlucky wizard on a winged horse and we we had spoken about that it's actually a greek mythology thing right. um the next team of, i just want to start singing glory days mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, the chudley cannons of the bright orange as melissa astutely pointed out they are the chicago cubs of the wizarding world and they changed their uh, motto from shall we conquer to let's just keep our fingers crossed and hope for the best. <laughs> Fantastic. I was listening to this on one of my many, many um, mom van drives of carting children to various locations. And both of my girls were in the car. And this it was just before this section. And they weren't really paying attention. They were kind of talking. And this came on and both of them died laughing. They were like, that is the best motto ever <laughs> we'll just cross our fingers and hope for the best that's the best we can do guys <laughs> all right next team foul mouth falcons they have a pretty good motto as well they do let us win but if we cannot win let us break a few heads i'm a huge fan of that motto yeah if you can't beat them beat them harder <laughs> <laughs> if you can't beat them beat them if you can't beat them just beat them just beat it Okay, um, maybe that would be their team song. Yeah. All right, um, here we go. One of my personal favorites, Hollyhead Harpies, the female team. Mm-hmm. This one, this that that team is mentioned multiple times. Like, kind of, uh, maybe we're not actually there in the main books where they're mentioned. So, well, but they they get offhand mentioned uh, here and there. Um, my personal this is, is that. Oh, go ahead. One of my biggest things, so it's definitely they are known for um, hiring only or playing only witches, right? Mm-hmm. But their captain, Glennon. Rudolph Brand? No, that was the, the Harriers captain from the other so, team. The what Heidelberg happened? Harriers. Okay, this is what I was confused about. I read this like three times and I was like, no, I think this is another guy and whatever. But I'm so confused. Please explain because maybe there's some viewers out there or listeners that are like me. And I'm like, wait, I thought these were chicks. Rudolph sounds like a dude. Yeah. So in 1953, one of the greatest Quidditch games ever played happened. It was a seven-day game. The the snitch was caught by Glynis Griffiths, who's one of the all-time best Hollyhead Harpies. Immediately following the game, the Heidelberg Harriers, which was the team they were playing, which is also a double H, which is from from Germany. From Germany. So that's why they're not showing up in this list right now. Right. The captain jumped off his broom and immediately went to the captain of the other team, Gwendolyn Morgan, and proposed marriage. Her response to the proposal was to concuss him with her broom. TBI. TBI. Got it. I love it. Okay. That's good. Um, I was very confused. I've read this over and over again saying they just told me right. that we were witches. And now the captain... Some man, obviously something lost in translation. It is my reading fault. And um, thank you for explaining that to me. During a game, the other guys who are also in HH. End of the game. At the end of the game, after this amazing, which was like one of the best games of Quidditch ever played, I guess because he it was such a great game, right? Jumped off and was like, I have to. He was inspired. I love this woman. Got it. Okay. All right. Oh, you're good. All right. Anything else about Hollyhead Harpies? Nope. They're awesome. All right. Ken Mayer Kestrels with the two yellow K's back to back. To me, it's like the whether you get a strikeout or a strikeout looking. Mm-hmm. Ooh, you don't want a double K and definitely not a backwards <laughs> K. But yeah. they got they got leprechaun mascots. Yeah. Yeah. Dude. They uh they're also accredited with inventing the chaser hawk's head attacking formation, which we'll discuss in chapter ten potentially. Can I point out just pronunciation? I always read that as hawk shed because oh, there's yeah. a- that's just like I- Abby's broads word. Broad's word. Uh, Long's word and broad's word. No, yeah. yeah. Anyway. Long's word. How about the Montrose Magpies, the most successful team in the history of the British and Irish League? So I, I don't necessarily love that they're the most successful team because always down with number one, right? But uh, I do love seeker Eunice Murray, who died in 1942, who once petitioned for a faster snitch because this is just this, this is just too easy. <laughs> 
That is excellent. And that actually opens the door to the thought that I, I know we've mentioned at one point of, are there different like grades of snitches? Like, is there like the same, is it all the same snitch? Is what they Ooh. use it, it at Hogwarts, the same one that they, the same <sighs> level of difficulty that Again, they use? Again, is this the baseball? Like, is this your T-ball? Right. Yeah. Rubber, mm -hmm. easy hit ball that if it hits you. Maybe a little bit bigger. Thing. Or, or is it? Soccer, where you start off at a size three, size three. And you eventually raise up to a size five. Mm -hmm. But on the size yeah, I mean, like the speed and like difficulty of capture does that does that increase over time? It doesn't I seem think like it, it should. Does, it, I think it should, but I'm sure it doesn't. I think that was originally one of my thoughts. I think we talked about it of why the Quidditch scoring doesn't seem to make so much sense is because one, Harry's quite good at it, and two, he catches it too quickly. Like if we would see some of the other matches where the chaser game was a lot more involved and a lot right. longer, where a lot higher scoring like games, then maybe it doesn't matter as much that it's 150 points because oh. you're dealing with 900 to 400 points. You know, like it's it just changes a bit. Welcome to Quidditch where the rules are made up and the points don't matter. <laughs> hey. I feel like that was just, uh, what's his name? Drew Carey? Drew Carey, yeah. yes. <laughs> you can't see. Wow. Abby just put figure glasses on to describe <laughs> Drew Carey for us. I couldn't come up with his name, but yep, she's right. She's always All right. right. Um, somebody write that down. I like credit. All right, here we go. Can we go? We're moving on to the pride of Porty, Portry. Mm -hmm. The go pride. Prides. Go no. prides. Go prides. Sorry. Anything else? No. Okay. I like that. Um, the daughter of their current keeper is the son Curly of the uh, the lead guitarist for the popular Wizarding band what? Weird Sisters. No. For it's Pride it. of Portry, the very yeah. last line. Truce. You said that weird though. You said that the most famous, her daughter and her son. I think it's. The most Sorry. famous teacher has a daughter and a son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Team, and the son is the guitarist. Yes. Like, two, two, two children by magnificently Catriona talented. McCormick. Thank you. Sorry, your wording made it. I was bit. reading it as I yeah I didn't read the whole thing. All loud. right, here we go. next team, Pumblemere United. I feel like that's an actual soccer team. Yeah, it has <laughs> to be right. It's too boring of a name. How many? How many? Uh, like uh, English Premier League teams are really just fronts for a, a secret Quidditch team. They have to be right? at least 12, at least 12 or 13, because that's the number they use. <laughs> that's how the number is. And they all have a firm. They all have Man. a firm. Yes. This is the oldest Quidditch team, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, they have an anthem that is sung, beat back those bludgers boys and chuck that quaffle here. <laughs> Anybody else have like a 1940s let's get them boys feel like? I feel like we need to do like some um, Harvard from uh, Gilmore Girls, you know, like whatever he would. Yeah, the, the I know this. Hold on. Yes, the there you go. Poops. The woof and poofs. Yes, <laughs> that's what I feel like. Puddlemere United would definitely have some woof and poofs. Oh, see, I was getting more like, um, like the Americana, like, let's send our boys to mm -hmm. the front. Tap War, war time. Okay. Yeah. All right. I do like that Celestina oh, Warbeck really just people. recorded a, a version of that to raise funds for St. Mungo's. That's that's pretty funny. All right. Next team is the Tuts Hill Tornadoes. Double T. We I, learned about them in the books at one point. I, do you remember that? I do wonder. Where are they from? Oh, not yet. Tuts Hill. Okay. I don't really know that is, but how many tornadoes are there in England? Not or many. Europe. They don't. I don't think they get tornadoes. So I just feel like this is just not a perfectly uh, named. I don't know. I mean, it's it'd be like it's if you if you name, name your team Typhoons, we don't have Typhoons. It's a good team name, though. Yeah, but and you're you aware of it. Them, yeah, I guess so. Founded in 1520, you may not have heard of a tornado before. The tornadoes. I mean, I feel like if you're like the Midwest tornadoes, watch out. But the tough still, I don't know. Never mind. Continuing. <laughs> I will say they um, hold the record for fastest capture of a snitch, 3.5 seconds. Yeah. I mean, one. tornadoes are fast. And maybe they should be like a dark greenish or purple. Not necessarily a blue. No. That's my purple, thought. Anyway. Now, a very, very quick Google search because we're all um, ignorant. Ignorant. Uh, <laughs> When you think of tornadoes, you probably imagine twisters moving across dust bowls in the United States. But in fact, the UK gets an average of 30 to 50 tornadoes a year. 
that's okay. more tornadoes per land than anywhere else in the world, except okay, weirdly so the Netherlands. <laughs> fine, we were wrong. I will take it. I was wrong. I'm sorry. I think of like yeah. You so know... take your take your UK <laughs> lack of <laughs> tornado <laughs> knowledge and shove it, Abby. <laughs> yeah. All right, it shoved. It shoved up. I'm it's sorry. Effectively shoved. <laughs> Consider it shoved. All right, next. Consider it shoved. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here we go. Uh, next team is the Wigtown Wanderers. I'm just going to read this one because I love them. Here we go. This Borders Club was founded in 1422 by the seven offspring of a wizarding butcher named Walter Parkin. The four brothers and three sisters were, by all accounts, a formidable team who rarely was- lost a match, partly, it is said, because of the intimidation felt by the opposing teams at the sight of Walter standing on the sideline with a wand in one hand and a meat cleaver in the other. <laughs> A Parkin descendant has often been found on the Wig Town team over the centuries, and in tribute to their origins, the players wear blood red robes with a silver meat cleaver upon the chest. That's pretty good. Yes, huge I feel, fan. I feel like we need some Parkin Wanderer jerseys made up, one through seven numbered. That'd be pretty good. That would be. We needed seven. We'll find somebody. We okay. already, we've already put our team together at one point. It'll be Glenn or Joe or Bo- it, it's Glenn. Really, let's be honest. <laughs> okay, then we have the Wimborne Wasps, also known as the state. The, their fans are known as Stingers. Mm-hmm. Famously, for what we know, uh, that's the team that Ludo Bagman played for. Ah, yes, that's true. All right, and that r- wraps rounds rounds out our. So, I do want to say that these wasps remind me of like the Hunger Games and the Tracker Jackers. Yeah. Just thought I should say that. Yes. Yeah. All right. Part six of our episode is chapter number eight, the spread of Quidditch worldwide. Um, so we've got basically it goes through the different continents, right? It goes through Europe and the teams that have developed through Europe. It goes through Australia slash New Zealand Africa, North America, South America, and then finishing off with Asia. Um, Europe seems to have had the most success, right? At proximity, I think, plays a part here, which makes sense. It's the closest to England, Scotland, the UK Isles, if you will. Uh, Melissa, first thought. I have a request. Okay. I really feel like I need a book on Wizarding World Theater. I, because I guarantee there are more engaging plays than the <laughs> French show of Alas, I've Transfigured My Feet. That sounds so very I, French, doesn't it? It does. It does. It's avant-garde. So I really feel like I need the um, Wizarding Theater Through the Ages book. If somebody could whip that out for me. The, the-, the Wizarding Theater Chronicles? Yes. Yes. This is what I need. I cannot go with you to the market today, Crapod. But Grinoui... I cannot carry the cow alone. You know, Crepode, that I am to be keeper this morning. Who will stop the quaffle if I do not? <laughs> it's great. It just sounds riveting. Yes. You know I can't carry the cow alone. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so the year 1473 saw the first ever Quidditch World Cup, though the nations represented were all European. The non-appearance of teams more distant of more distant nations to be put down to the collapse of owls bearing letters of invitation. The reluctance <laughs> of those invited to make such a long and perilous journey or perhaps perhaps a simple preference for staying at home. I can get down with that. I like staying home. So we at the very end of the European section it it has a, a list of some of the more well known European teams. There's the Vrats of Vultures from Bulgaria. Um there is the Quiberon Quaffle Punchers from France. Quaffle Punchers is a pretty funny name. Uh, there's our very astute uh, Heidelberg Harriers. The team that the Irish captain Darren O'Hare once famously said was fiercer than a dragon and, and is fierce, fiercer than a dragon and twice as clever. Um, L- Luxembourg, always a strong Quidditch nation, gave us the Bigginville Bombers. Uh, Portuguese team Braga Broomfleet. And the Polish Grodzisk Goblins. That's where Josef Ronski was most famous for playing. So, any thoughts on the European teams? Okay. Australia and New Zealand uh, had a very successful introduction to the game. Uh, and they've, they've, the spread of Quidditch in Australia is believed to have had 
occurred at the same at some time in the 18th century. Australia may be said to have an ideal Quidditch playing territory given the great expanses of uninhabited outback where Quidditch pl- pitches may be established. So that's right, a geographic feature that is very conducive to the area, the the, the area that you've got. So some of the most famous teams from there are the Mutahora Macaws from New Zealand, the Thunderlara Thunderers, and the Wollongong Warriors. I like that um, there's so much dislike between those last two teams that uh, that like a, a response to it, what do they say, an unlikely claim or both. So like like the sarcastic yes, yeah, sure, right thing mm-hmm. is, yeah, I think I'll go volunteer to rep the next Thunder or Warrior game. It's just that violent and sure. dangerous. That's I can do. Yeah. yeah. I like that. Uh, it talks about the, we'll call it a little bit slower spread to Africa. Um, and that was mainly due to, um, well, the introduction was mainly due to the European wizards and wizards, witches traveling there in search of information on alchemy and astronomy, uh, subjects in which African wizards have always been particularly skilled. I like that bit of knowledge, right? It's not like, oh, they just weren't good at magic. No, they they were just focused on other things, right? They have different skill sets. Um, and we don't get to hear much about African nations, right, in general in, in these books. But the Quidditch especially in Uganda is, is very, very stringent, right? It's, it's become a lot more, um, one of the emerging as a keen playing nation. Uh, I like that. They've got the team, the proud sticks that are so good that the last, that the Ugandan world cup team, the most recent one, six of the seven Ugandan team members were from the proud sticks. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's, it says the highest number of flyers from a single team ever united on a national side. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty amazing. The Patonga Proud Sticks. Yep. And they had just, in 1986, held the Montrose Magpies to a draw, right? So that's basically you played long enough that both teams decided to to pull the plug on the game. And uh, so that's, I mean, Magpies are a pretty good team. So that's that's nice. There's also the Chamba Charmers, the Gimbi Giant Slayers from Ethiopia, and the Sumbwanga Sunrays from Tanzania. North America. Um, this. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to say my comment really quick, then you people Go can for talk. it. The darn American sports interrupting USA's involvement in international sports, which are better and more amazing. Look at it, you, American football has a very similar feel to that, right? Where, you know, that, that game's fine. We'll play it, but we're also going to take it and change it to be our own thing, right? Sure. American football, what's that? <laughs> um, it's called Quad Pod. Oh, it's called, that sucks. It's sorry. called Quad Pod. Oh, I'm sorry, that's almost a bad word. Second one on our podcast. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, no. So I like I, it, I really like the alignment to the, the actual muggle world of sports in that. Our version, like it, it just, it's not quite as popular or I infamous. Yet do we have-, have a serious question about all these teams that we're talking about, right? Does New Zealand have a team? Yes. Uh-huh. Yep. They have the Mutahoro Macaws as one of their most well-known teams. Okay. Okay. And they are, they're famous red, yellow, and blue robes and their Phoenix mascot, Sparky. Red, yellow, and blue? Yeah, they're macaws. That's they're like a, parrots. That's a, no, I, I get it. A macaw. I've seen Rio one time or two. But um, wait, you chose to watch a bird movie? Uh, Rio, it's a good movie. It's cute. It's heartwarming. Yes, I did. Birds. But I do love. Her house sigil's new, a bird. Yes. Yeah, see what I mean? <laughs> the All Blacks. Oh, those yeah. Those are my boys. Oh, yeah. The, oh, yeah. Got to so love the I was the all wondering. Blacks. You're right. They they are mentioned in here. I was wondering if we were going to get any all bra- all black um like allu- allusion of- to that idea. Yes. Yeah. Like the <sighs> you know, they're they're amazing. Anyways, go ahead. It does Rugby. it does say Rugby that in- Antipodean teams have always thrilled European crowds with their speed and showmanship. So that That's that goes to a similar type of the yes. showmanship of it, right? Uh, the the character of the team is is loud and proud. So I I think that kind of hints at that. I like at the, least. What is that 
on Amazon. If you have Amazon Prime, you can watch like the All or Nothing series. Mm -hmm. Is that what it's called? I think so. The a lot of them are American football teams. The best season of it is literally when they follow the New Zealand All Blacks. Mm -hmm. so I'll have to good. check that out. You've mentioned that before. I haven't oh, it watched is it yet. So good, like it enlightened my life so much. They, I know nothing of rugby other than they are some tough dudes. All Blacks are my team for life. Yeah. Sorry. No, you're good. So we did have some teams named from Canada. Canada has given us three of the most accomplished Quidditch teams in the world. There's the Moose Jaw Meteorites. Great name. Moose Jaw. The Haley, Haleybury Hammers and the Stonewall Stormers. Um, so that's that's great for Canada, right? Go, go Mounties. Oh, Canada. Um, but then it starts talking about how Quad Pod in the United States is much more popular and there are still a, it's it's very much just like a slightly changed version of of quidditch right um which i'm a little are you I'm surprised at this Massachusetts. yeah <laughs> there are 11 players aside in the game of quad pod they throw the quad or modified quaffle from team member to team member attempting to get it into the pot at the end of the pitch before it explodes is and there a whole bunch of timeouts probably stop and go <laughs> right Ooh. Any player in possession. Is there a different team for offense than there is for defense. And special teams. Okay, let's let's continue. <laughs> we obviously are not fans of I this know. Americanized sport. Any player in possession of the quad Bring when it explodes. <laughs> I loved stooging. <laughs> Bring back my baskets. Bring back the baskets. Oh, Hello, dark hole we have wandered into. <laughs> Any player in possession of the quad when it explodes must leave the pitch. Once the quad is safely in the pot, a small cauldron containing a solution which will prevent the quad from exploding, the scorer's team is awarded a point and a new quad is brought onto the pitch. Quad pot has had some success as a minority sport in Europe, though the vast majority of wizards remain faithful to Quidditch. A new quad. Does that mean another animal has to die to give us their bladder? That's all I want to know. I did die. Save uh, the pigs. I would assume that it's a manufactured ball at this point. I would hope so. So it's leather balls. The so more animals. Great. They just basically took. They basically took the the peas good quaffle and bewitched it to explode. It's the same. Me and Gertie are on the same page. This is ridiculous. At this point. <laughs> and modesty. Yeah. But recently, at the time of printing, United States has shown up in the international Quidditch realm, right? In that in that level, and the Sweetwater All Stars from Texas and the Fitchburg Finches from Massachusetts have been uh, making headway into the Quidditch, the international league. They must be an all female team. That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> So then we have South America, where it must compete with Quad Pod there as well. Um, so that's a bit of a change, but they've also are believed to have their first exposure to Quidditch from European wizards sent by the International Confederation to monitor the number of Viper Tooths, Peru's native dragon. Uh, Quidditch has become a veritable obsession of the wizard community there since that time. And their most famous team, the Terrapoto Tree Skimmers, recently found toured Europe to great acclaim. So again, growing, although small, right, in the in both Americas. And then we have Asia, where most of the countries, uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Iran, Mongolia, um, preferred, basically historically, had their flying carpets. And so Quidditch didn't really fit into their normal um transportation so but there has been an explosion in japan mm -hmm. and we've got the toyahashi tengu and the gordok gargoyles and they also participated in the 1994 quidditch world cup i will say about japan their look on life and sports should be examined by all cultures from riding a bike to running like it is incredibly I don't even know what I want to say. Like, inspiring. My children were able to ride a two-wheeled bicycle by the time they were three years old. All of them. No training wheels, no nothing, because of what I've learned in Japan. They're incredibly athletic, and their way of going about it is so holistic. Love it. Nice. 
One thing I noticed over this entire section is the spread of Quidditch really seems to mirror the spread of Scotch worldwide. I know that seems like Scotch? an odd, yeah, Scotch whiskey might seem like an odd comparison, but I did just recently watch like a history of Scotch documentary just because I was curious. And it's obviously starts in Scotland, kind of goes around the, the British Isles and Ireland a bit. Gets slightly changed here and there, right? You have Irish whiskeys and different types of whiskeys there's around, but H and there's not an H. Right, I it's a it. thing. Yeah, it's a thing. Right. Um, but it also goes to America and gets changed, right? You have Tennessee whiskey and bourbon, which very different than Scotch, right? But the places that like true Scotch internationally have been harnessed and really well received, New Zealand, Japan, like those are like the two <laughs> primary non-Scotland areas that are producing Scotch. I don't know if you can technically call it scotch if it's not made in Scotland, but it's like the exact same procedures and everything. And they do it such a way. Scotch inspired whiskey. And uh, it just, as I was reading, it's like, huh, that seems really specific that those line up so well. So either Quidditch just follows scotch or people that enjoy scotch also enjoy Quidditch. So I don't know. Or maybe JK Rowling just likes scotch. That's what I'm really getting at. She probably does. Well, she is from Scotland. Good for her. Okay. Who doesn't like scotch? Scotch, scotch, scotch. All right. Final part of our episode here. Ooh. The development of the racing room, which is chapter nine and chapter 10, Quidditch today. Abby, you want to kick us off here with your first thought? Not exceptionally, but uh, <laughs> Quidditch today. It's a good game, folks. I apologize. Continue on. Anybody else? <laughs> Melissa, do you have any thoughts on the development of the racing room? Do I really don't have like it's interesting to see how different companies started producing and then there was the competition mm -hmm. amongst them, um, particularly between the clean the clean sweeps and the comet company. Right. Um, my personal favorite is the limited rise of the shooting star, a beloved broom favorite of our own Madame Hooch. Yes. Nope. Oh, what? you said shooting star. Sorry. Yep. Oh, I apologize. I apologize. I. It's the no. silver I arrow. Sticks. No, she liked the shooting star. That the the Nimbus 2000 reminded her of the old shooting stars. Book one. Okay. Yep. Right. It's not book one. It's it's book three when he's looking at getting a new broom after his is destroyed. Okay, but she brings up the shooting star. That is like her comparison piece. So. That, that it just reminded me of her. Other than that, I don't really have anything other than the uncomfortableness before the cushioning charm. That seems a bit, um, I don't know. A, a the bit only of thing I have on this whole part is I was really proud of myself when I want to say, was it Hogwarts Mystery or Hogwarts, whatever the app you could play where you could like be a Hogwarts student? Yes. And you were like in class and Bill Weasley was like two years older than you. Yes, mm -hmm. I know what you're talking about. And then they Hogwarts said something. Mystery, yeah. Okay, so then they said something about oh, and they can get a firebolt. And I texted you guys, you guys, you guys, and I said, hey, how can this be possibly right when we are years before Harry Potter and the firebolt is out? Right. Yep. So I quickly assessed my Quidditch book here, and I was like, nope. This app is totally wrong. It's the proudest moment of my Harry Potter life. Good job. I'm glad I that found one tiny, minuscule like, detail detail that was not exactly correct. We, and I was like, I'm still proud Boom. of you. I'm, I'm awesome. so proud of myself. I still have the first edition Harry Potter book where they say that his dad came out before his mom. Mm -hmm. I never caught that until Melissa and Luke pointed that out. So that's fine. But I got the racing brooms right and I feel like an accomplished human being. <laughs> I feel accomplished for you. And it is definitely the silver arrow that Madam Hooch appreciated. Are you kidding? I'm absolutely positive. Aww. And Ron had an old shooting star that used to get outstripped by butterflies. That's what it was. Okay. Whatever. Fine. I lose my point. I take your point back. No points for you. And no soup. <laughs> point <laughs> point redacted. Whatever. I'm not a sporter anyway. She doesn't she doesn't do the sporter stuff. She doesn't sport. I just the overall development of the broom. I like like the cushioning charm, right? Makes sense. <laughs> like that just seems incredibly uncomfortable. And they there's like the line of um it might have been early, early on. I didn't highlight in this book, so it's harder to find things, but 
Um, but splinter filled buttocks, I think that was early, yeah. early on oh, with the, yes. uh, like the first invention of the, yes. of the brooms. Um, but like the, yeah, the cushing charm, the breaking charm, right? Cause if you're going to be playing a high speed, quick reaction game, you got to be able to stop and turn quicker as well. And just like Melissa had mentioned between the different companies that got there, it be kind of, kind of became like a broom arms race, right? Like we can go faster, but we can stop quicker. So it's like, speed versus agility and i just thought it was pretty well done because that's what would happen right when you get into a, a racing broom type competition are you an adidas copa kind of girl or are you are like the nike new no sock shoe kind of girl i'm an that's adidas like copa kind of girl abby you know that about me i yeah. i mean really it comes down are you a coke or a pepsi well, I should be a Pepsi since it's born right here in the Carolinas, but Coke all the way. Sorry. Yeah, I'm Team Coke. <laughs> team Coke. Luke? I like Budweiser both. for him. I like both. They're fine. I don't drink much soda, honestly. I haven't had a soda in 15 months, and I'm still Team Coke. I would I would choose Pepsi, I, I think, if I had to. Of course you would. Newborn But I'm such Carolina. a hipster, so. A hipster? Oh, I <laughs> like them. <laughs> I'll, I'm for it. I was going to call you a scruffy looking nerf herder, but that's just me. <laughs> uh, we do have some good, just funny or broom names, right? I'll just do a quick list. And we have the original moon trimmer. There's the silver arrow, the clean sleep, clean sweep one, comet 140. Those both go into whole series. Uh, the tinder blast, the swift stick and the shooting star. And then we get into the Nimbus series and then the twigger nineties. So, we also know that one of our favorite brooms is left out of this list because it was being developed in the books, as Abby just mentioned. There's no Firebolt mentioned, uh -oh. and which we're not going to talk about today, but in the later Quidditch things post this book, which the audiobook does an awesome dramatization of the 2014 Quidditch World Cup mm -hmm. and basically the history from the end of this book that we're talking about through then. Uh, there's also another broom that's introduced that's apparently pretty dangerous. Um, Quidditch today for chapter 10 in this section here. Um, we, we talk about different formations and different strategies that that players or teams will will use. And there's the bludger beat backbeat, doppelbeater defense, double eight loop, hawks head attack formation, Parkins pincer, Plumpton pass, poor scoff ploy, reverse pass, sloth grip roll, starfish and stick, Transylvanian tackle, Wollongong shimmy, and the Ronsky feint. Melissa, you have a thought? Important. I do. I like the Transylvanian tackle that it's a fake punch to the nose. Right. That and, and and it's one of those, Benji would appreciate this, it's a technically correct kind of rule, as in like, as long as contact is not made, it's not illegal because you're not technically touching them. Mm -hmm. It's the old, I'm not touching you. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. I have my finger three centimeters from your eyeball, but I am not touching you. Therefore, it is deemed fair play. <laughs> the back of the the van triple seater sitting in the middle i'm not touching you mm -hmm. i'm not touching you that's why luke and i would fight to be the double seater at the middle and you would win and it would be matthew benji and i in the back and i'd be in the middle <laughs> like hockey puck oh, luke you're welcome <laughs> huh. i think my favorite of these are the starfish and stick i Keep, agree keeper defense yeah. The keeper holds the broom horizontally with one hand and one foot curled around the handle while keeping all limbs outstretched. See figure G. I'll hold it up for the camera. So if you ever see this, I'll hit my cup too while doing it. There's a nice little hand-drawn illustration of it. And it continues to say the starfish without stick should never be attempted. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's hilarious. Also, if your children are um, trying to learn how to swim, teach them the starfish on their backs. It's a good, good thing to teach kids. Starfish save a life. Abby, any thoughts on any of these formations? I am a big fan. Ah, let me turn to it. I'm so sorry. Um, it's a defense because I'm always defensive minded. Doppelbeater defense. I yes, you both, got it. Both beaters hit a bludger at the same time for extra power, resulting and in it, a bludger attack of greater severity. Even this astute book talks about the beaters being just you know thugs on brooms. No, defense wins championships, folks. <laughs> Huge believer in it. 
from this day till the end of my days. I like that defense. All right. So the very, very last page of this, I'll just read it. It's kind of a conclusion to the book. It says, there can be no doubt that Quidditch has changed beyond all recognition since Gertie Kettle first watched those numbskulls on Quidditch Marsh. Perhaps had she lived today, she too would have thrilled to the poetry and power of Quidditch. Long may the game continue to evolve, and long may future generations of witches and wizards enjoy this most glorious of sports. Pretty good wrap up there, Kettleworthy. I I think that was well, well stated. So we're going to do our quick superlatives here, right? And uh, we just have one final one. We've kind of talked about our favorite rules along the way, our favorite. uh, What was the other one that we did? The I don't remember what it was. It was early on. Anyway, we're going to talk about our favorite Quidditch team. Abby, do you have Um, a favorite Quidditch team? I do, and I've lost my page of what they're actually called. Oh, boy. I told you all, though. It's the Scottish team. It's not in here. It starts with a P. It does. Oh, the Pride of Portree. Yeah. Pride, Pride of Portree. The Prides. Yes. Go Prides. Go Prides. Um, my my biggest thing about the Pride is I wonder what their uniforms look like. Okay? If you follow me here, give me a second. So we have the Pride, and we're running through, and we're whatever colors we are, but we are Scots. We have to be in kilts, right? <laughs> kilts on brooms. Who doesn't like that? I do. <laughs> <laughs> so it um, says, the, the Prides, as they are known to their fans wear deep purple robes with a gold star on the chest. Doesn't yeah. say anything about kilts, but they wear kilts guaranteed. They have to, right? Robes That's kind of are kilts, aren't they? They're kind of I full, mean, full body kilt. Maybe. <laughs> and maybe like the full body kilt, the full body kilt. <laughs> maybe this, maybe the English wear pants underneath their leggings or whatever, but the Scots definitely wear kilts. And that's why they're my faves. <laughs> oh, Melissa, what is your favorite team? Um, the Wigtown Wanderers. I love that it's just a family team Mm -hmm. and that the dad was really scary. (laughs) And they honored that by putting a meat cleaver on their uniform. I'm a big fan of Wigtown and apparently Kenilworthy and I can be buds and pal around and travel after their team. There you go. There you go. My favorite team. I'm going to, I'm going to give it up for the Holy head harpies, the the Welsh all women's team. I, I think that's brilliant. I think they're awesome. And uh, you can see me supporting a, ho- a Holy Head Harpies jersey at some point in my life. So I think that is going to pretty much wrap us up here. Make sure you join us on social media. We are on Instagram and on Twitter at Not Named Podcast. To send us your digital owls at Not Named Podcast at gmail.com. Check out this show and all of the shows in our family at thepodcastthat.com. Before we wrap all of this up, one more thing. Abby, this was your first time reading this book, right? Yes. Overall thoughts. What did you think? I think I mentioned it earlier. I just love that it is written in such an air of a sports, mostly like the commentary, but the foreword, the after remarks, the remarks about the author. They cannot help but be sports fans themselves. They're writing in such a uh, way that myself as like a Cardinals fan, I just can't help but throw that in there. It's just, I can't stop it. It doesn't happen. So I like that the foreword with the Chudley Cannons and in the, about the author, he talks about, oh, I think it's part of me United that he speaks about. Um, he's like, and they play this weekend. It just happens. I like that it's written from a sports fan or commentator perspective. Um, the history of it is just perfect. And who can't like the fact that the proceeds are going to worthy causes? I'm a big fan. Mm-hmm. Melissa, any conclusions or comparisons um, to Fantastic Beasts at all? I There was a lot of similarities in the way rules develop over time. And I think that has a very naturally historic ring to it. Mm-hmm. I definitely really feel like this was more fun than Fantastic Beasts, as in like, not that Fantastic Beasts wasn't fun, but um, Newt's Commander is definitely a man of science. And so a lot of his descriptions were scientific in nature, mm-hmm. whereas Kenilworthy Wisp seems like a guy who'd be fun to go and have a beer with. Oh, yeah. So like his tone was a lot more fun and there was a lot more, um, there's a lot more people and characters in this story. So you've got a lot more of the six-year-old crying because we're not going to stooge anymore. I love stooging. Like, <laughs> Me and my dad love when they beat the beaters or beat the keepers. 
and Gertie, who only knows Tuesday, and and uh, oh, who's who's my girl? Hashtag girl. Um, modesty. Modesty. And and her like save the snidgets campaign. I just like that we got a lot more world of people. Building. Bring back our baskets. <laughs> right. Like those are just the kinds of things that I enjoy because. As much as I love Hogwarts, I, it's so limited. There's so much world out there, so it's nice to get a little bit more of the world that you don't get to see when you're when you have a Harry focused story. Mm-hmm. I couldn't agree with both of you anymore. You know, I, I it's that's perfect. I love the tone. I love how J.K. so effectively writes in other people's voices. Like it comes across as well done each time. It never feels like oh that's. That's J.K. Rowling talking there. It's no, that's kind of worthy, kind of worthy wisp, or that's modesty writing, or that's the little boy. You know, like, all of these characters that we're never going to see again, as far as we know. I mean, it, we've never seen it before. Very few of them cross over into the series that we have, but they all feel like fully fledged people, right? And that's there. She's writing good characters, and. Right along with that, like Abby said, it's going to a great cause. So gotta love that. It's for a reason why this is why this is out here. It's not just a money grab. There's there's a, a true cause, and uh, I, I fully appreciate that. And like Melissa also said, I love the world building stuff. I I really love when Harry's not at Hogwarts. I love Hogwarts. I do. But anytime we get a glimpse of non Harry focused stuff. That's like my favorite, which is why like the Diagon Alley chapter in book three is always the one that stands out to me so much because you have that chance to meet all of these other characters that are just living their adult lives, right? And Harry's interacting with them as a kid would, and it just feels good. So I love the breath of fresh air that these little books, these Hogwarts library books give us. And uh, I've been looking forward to doing these since we started book one. And uh, Trust me, he has. Yeah. All the time. He never let me forget about them. You tried to. And I said, nope. I did. I really did. But anyway, please subscribe to our show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And also to the podcast, that family of podcasts on YouTube. Search that whole thing. And uh, that's where all of our shows are going to be publishing episodes. Uh, either Some of them will have video. Some of them will just be audio only. But that will be the most consistent place to find all of our live streams in future and all of our episodes from every one of our shows. So check us out there. This show and all of our shows at thepodcastthat.com are produced with the love and support of our wonderful Imaginary Legion patrons. Learn more about our reward tiers at patreon.com slash stay imaginary. So this is typically the time where I say, join us next week when we talk about chapter blah, blah, blah. Only I don't have that. We have some special releases coming up for you for the rest of 2019. Luke, can you tell us about those? Yeah. So in the uh, upcoming weeks, you're going to get all of the previously unreleased book four unrestricted sections, right? So for our five chapter recap episodes, we had pulled our unrestricted sections to be patron only Uh, here being post book four. We are not going to release those to the public. And um, see what you missed out on other discussions that we have. If you heard us allude to things that we had talked about, but you're like, hey, I never heard that. Maybe it wasn't an unrestricted section. That's possible. Remember, those are all spoiler filled. So if you are following along with us book by book as a either spoiler free read or if you've never read them before, we'll be back uh, in January. Top of the top of the year, 2020, uh, starting book five. So we will see you then. Top of the morning to you. Did anybody else know that about this book? About the Irish not liking Top of the Morning? Anybody have any idea what I'm talking about here? Nope. So Top of the Morning. I swear, it's. I read this in this book that Top of the Morning, they had that. Oh, no, it wasn't. It was a Twitter thing. Yeah, I didn't read the Twitter version of this book. I didn't read the Twitter version. No, it was a Twitter post. And in the book, in the movie of movie four, which I don't know if you guys have released yet or not. Yep, it's out. It has top of the morning to you released uh, like part of the Irish fans. Oh, um, okay. In the Quidditch World Cup stuff. In the Quidditch World Cup. And they're like, how, uh, what's the word I want to say? Like um, almost. Stereotypical or. Stereotypical. But Irish people apparently hate that. I just thought I read that with this. 
but I didn't. I saw it on Twitter. It I does apologize. relate, though. It I relates digress. to the 1994 Quidditch yes. World Cup. So apparently in the movie, there's a poster that says top of the morning to you. And people on Twitter were like, I cannot believe we have not seen this. Like, I haven't realized that that's what the poster in the movie as it like flashes by says, yeah. because it is such a like contested Stereo. saying stereotype in Ireland because they don't actually say top of the morning <laughs> to you. <laughs> Heidi, 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 heidi. Anyways, sorry. Go on with this book here. Well, until we talk to you again, stay imaginary. Thanks.